just wanna bang on them.
Look. If it's for me, then who be against me? No one, no one. If it's for me, then who be against me? No one, no one. If it's for me, then who be against me? No one, no one. If it's for me, then who be against me? No one, no one. If it's for me, I'm running it back. On the field, all I know is attack. I'm a catch, don't care about the cash. We ahead, we don't need no advance. When I threw it, it went right over your head. Most of them don't even hear what he said. I'ma slow it, I'ma say it again. This time, please read it, don't leave it on red. Is a hand. He's repent of your sins. The man with a pen, yeah. yeah. Talking to God while he's writing it down. It was worse cause they wanted him dead, yeah. What push is a man who go talk about a life that he's never seen and never lived, yeah. What push is a man who go speak with his chest, no one ups in the crowd while him dead, yeah. Just please pick up that bucket. Yeah. Regular, it's never regular, I'm on the schedule, yeah I know that it is a level up, I'm always messing up So are the people in it I got no time for no games, yeah All they be selling is pain, yeah The hand that you give, watch them take it You made it, you thought you were safer All the money you making them stack But you hope you ain't getting that bad So you sit, let the demons attack While I sit with my peace, let them fight on my behalf If it's for me, then who be against me? No one, no one If it's for me, then who be against me? No one, no one If it's for me, then who be against me? Time and I didn't know me. I was in a place I was fighting demons. Got me right, told me leave them. Can't go back to that season. Can't go back to that season. Hey, well, I'm so excited to be with you. First things first, for all of my regulars, you know the deal. If you could hear me, put a thumbs up in the chat or put a one in the chat. That way, we don't get too far along. We want to make sure the audio is good for everybody. We want to make sure this is a good experience. So I'm excited to be with you, but let's get a thumbs up in the chat. That way, I know everyone can hear us. Papa look at Revo Suave. God bless you, son. One, one. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Oh, my sister Carmela's here. Oh, I love you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So the audio's good. This is the next thing we're going to do. 
we're gonna put the music back on because there's a hundred some people in here, but there's only like a few likes. Back out, like the video. That way we don't have to mute tonight, okay? Because I promised that we weren't gonna mute it. However, we gotta keep the energy right. So I want y'all to hit the like button and share this with somebody and we'll be right back.
different beat, yeah. I'm rapping long cause I'm stepping on toes and the flow still insane, yeah. When I step on the scene, it's about him, no, it's not about me. Got diamonds on my body, but it don't make me. I was stopping at the bands, but I ain't half peace. Moving out of time, man, I didn't know me. I was in a place, I was fighting demons. Got me right, told me leaving. Can't go back to that season. Can't go back to that season. Yo, we unmuted. Perfect. So we back. Thank you guys for cooperating. Now, in light of that, we've already started the timer, so we got to catch up, okay? But I am so excited to be with you. God will be glorified. And it's going to be a good time. It's going to be special. Now, like I told you before, I talked on Instagram Live and I shared some things. There's been so much resistance around this. I want to teach you unlock the voice of God, ain't no issues. Teach you about meditating, ain't no issues. Teach you how to prophesy, no issues. Teach you about heaven, the world of spirits. Teach you about encountering. Teach you about Mount Zion. Teach you about anything, no issues whatsoever. However, purity is one thing that the Lord desires, and it's one thing that the enemy will always come against. That's why there's been so much resistance around this. However, with God's grace, what's going to happen is people will be allowed to come into this, okay? And I already gave the contingencies. The audio, no matter what I believe, will still be allowed to flow through even if something happens. So if for some reason it gets knocked out, just listen, right? That way we can fight through and press through and get what all God has for us, amen? So when we talk about the trap of sexual sin, I told my wife this. I said, you know, God really put this in my heart to share. Now, I'm going to share things that you've already heard. So it's not that you're going to learn something new. Now, I know also you will learn something new because if you know me, God's given me things to give to his people. So I can almost tell you now there are going to be things you hear from me like, man, I never knew that. I'm also going to break down some of the spiritual dynamics behind some of the things that we already know, like sex in your dreams, like spirit spouses, like masturbation, like being attacked within your dreams. There's moving parts that people don't understand that you can't necessarily just find in a book. You can't open your Bible and find out the dynamics behind it. Neither can you open a book behind it. You have to talk to spiritual men to get it. So there's certain things God has given me with God's grace that I'm going to share. That's going to be an extreme blessing to people and where they are with God. Right now, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to simply read the scriptures. I have John with me. John will be reading through some scriptures. And we're going to break some things down. Very simple. Just line upon line, things that you already know. But behind what I'm saying is grace. When I say grace, meaning empowerment. And you guys have heard me say it, I'm never alone. So God is with me. The Holy Spirit is in me. His son is working through me. The angels are with me. So grace behind it is going to bring people freedom in ways that they can't even imagine. You understand? Freedom in ways that you can't even imagine. Now, with the freedom that you can't imagine, this is what I want you to understand. Some of you are going to feel the need to cry when we start talking about certain things. Just cry. Some of you will feel broken before God about certain things. Be broken. Some of you may feel a twitch. Just twitch. There's different dynamics that will be working throughout this. Now, at the end, we're going to take a small break, and then we're going to do some deliverance. My wife will help coach through like what that's going to look like, but we'll kind of move some chairs and we're just going to go for it. Now, after that, that's where deliverance truly starts. So we think about deliverance in the sense of like, hey, casting out the devil, deliverance. However, that's not the end all. That's actually the beginning of deliverance. That's actually the starting process. Casting the devil out is the beginning process, not the end process. You understand what I'm saying? Excuse me. 
casting the devil out is the beginning process, not the end process. And what it needs is the actual renewing. Y'all give me a second. Y'all give me one second, please. I'm sorry about that. We were dismissing our children. If you have children, it's probably a good time to dismiss your children also. Okay. So we were dismissing our children. I apologize. But what was I saying before that? They distracted me. You okay? Just help me. Help me. YouTube, help me pick back up where I left off. They threw me off. Yeah. So you're going to feel the need for all these different things. Just go with it. And then at the end, I'm going to pray for everybody. That's everybody online. I think my wife's going to put a link for Zoom because some of you may feel some extra things. You may need extra help. And that way we can see you and minister to you. Amen. But like I said, this is the beginning of the deliverance process. This isn't the end. The, de the deliverance process, casting out a devil is the first step. However, we have to now make the soul whole. That's where we need the washing and the renewing of the word to come over Emmanuel. It says that you're cleansed by the word of God, where it talks about our minds will be renewed by the washing of the water of the word, that his word will enter us and bring us light, all right? This is the next step that comes with this. So this won't just be a, we talked about the trap of sexual sin, congratulations, go on, do well. We will figure out a way of how we're going to continue to get the people what they need for the washing of the word, whether that's through Instagram, uh, email series, I'm not sure how we're going to do it, but just stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe. We're going to make sure people have the steps necessary to walk out being free. We're going to make sure people have the steps necessary to walk out being whole. Because it's not enough to teach you that it's a spirit that's having sex within your dreams. I got to teach you how to walk this out. I got to teach you how to be delivered and also made whole. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to share certain things with you. And just by virtue of me sharing. That's one of my graces. By virtue of me sharing, some of you are going to receive deliverance. It's not even going to be that, oh, man, we start casting devils out, bop, 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 bop. We're going to do that, too. But remember, even Jesus said that he went about preaching deliverance. So him preaching deliverance, him casting out devils are two different things. That means that there's a certain proclamation with the spirit behind it that can make a person be free. You understand? Kind of like when the young man said, I'm going to give up smoking marijuana once I broke down to him what hydroponics were and how he was dealing in witchcraft. Once he realized he didn't want, no longer want parts of that sorcery. Why? The preaching allowed him to be delivered. Then he went home, took all of his stuff, threw it away and flushed it down the toilet. So there's going to be some people just by default, by the proclamation, something's going to hit you within your spirit. You're going to be free. And then there's going to be others that were going to cast the devil out. And then you're going to be free. But the guarantee is Jesus is willing to set all of his people free. Mm -hmm. Amen. But this is the beginning process. I can't stress that enough. Okay. Excellent. So let's start with, let me see. And if you know me, I typically just teach. Like I don't, I just kind of go for it. Even in this case, I was worried about the enemy jacking me and me not being able to remember certain things. So I've, I've even taken the liberty with my phone to write some things down so that way it'll help us make sure we talk about a few things. Amen? Amen. Excellent. So let's start with um, John, if you could give me Numbers 31. Thank you, Lord. And I'm going to let you know how much to read. Let me find it too. Hold on, let me look for it. Balaam. Let's do this, John. Let's do numbers 22 instead. I'll get numbers 31. Okay. So if you do numbers 22 for me. And let's start at 
verse 18. No, no, I promise no muting. I, I, that's my word, no muting. You said verse 18? You're going to go 18, and I want you to go to... Now, you know, I'm, I'm anti-read the word of God this way. However, just read that suck as fast as you can because it's a lot. So go through. Go to verse 18. Verse 33, and then I'll pick up and read the rest for you. Okay. Now, I can tell you now the rest of this stuff, we're not going to read all these long scriptures. So you're going to have to hear, and that's what it's going to be. But that way they can't say, wait, they didn't read anything. This is what we're doing. So you read to that, and then I'll pick up from there. All right. Then Excellent. Balaam answered and said to the servant Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to you, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the prince of Moab. Then, then God's anger was aroused because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as the adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and, two, and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field so Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on the on this side and a wall on that side and when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall so he struck her again then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger arose, was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I will kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have written ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, No. Perfect. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me. Three, the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would also have killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel, <clears throat> Excuse me, of the Lord, I have sinned. For I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Now when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the border at the Arnon, the boundary of the territory. Then Balak said to Balaam, Did I not earnestly send to you calling for you? Excuse me. Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, Look, I have come to you. Now, I, now have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. So Balaam went, Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kirthjah Huzath. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. So it was the next day that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal that from there he might observe the extent of the people. Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me, and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam 
offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, stand by your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height and God met Balaam and he said to him, I have prepared the seven altars and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return to Balak and thus you shall speak. So he returned to him and there he was standing by his burnt offering, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how, how excuse me, shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him and from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like this. Then Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies and look, you have blessed them bountifully. So he answered and said, must I not take heed and speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? Now I'm going to stop there because it's a lot. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm tired of reading it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So <laughs> just so you know, this occurrence happens three more additional times. Balak brings Balaam because he wants Balaam to curse the children of Israel. He takes him to the high place to the altars of Baal. He says, let's prepare a sacrifice together. And they built seven altars. Not Balaam built seven altars. Him and Balak, they built seven altars together. Yet God is still willing to come speak. Here he's building altars in the high places of Baal and God is still willing to come speak. So that right there automatically should change your theology about how God can reach us. You understand? Yes. Now, as you continue this discourse, he goes on continually says, all right, let me take him to another place. They continue the same process. He says, I cannot curse whom God has blessed. That's where we get that from. You can't curse what God has blessed. That saying comes from this. Mm -hmm. Then he takes him a third time to another place. And he says, I cannot curse what God has blessed. Then he tries one more time. He says, look, I can't curse what God has blessed. Now, what happens is God isn't willing to curse these individuals because they belong to him. Now, mind you, the dynamic is these people already had sin amongst them. We see that because Moses talks about the camp and sin being amongst them and how they would deal with certain things. This is why they had the laws. So it wasn't that they were perfect, but they were still God's people. So this means that God was willing to keep them even in the midst of their downfalls. But when we get to Revelations, he talks about it and it says that I think it's Revelations 2. Look it up for me and see if, if that's that. I think it's Revelations 2 and like 14. But if you look it up, it should say something like, I have this against you as you err in the way of Balaam, something to that extent. So even while he's looking this up, I would just mention in the scripture, but Balaam doesn't have the capability to curse what God has blessed. Yet, when we get to Revelations, he says, I have this thing against you that you err in the way of Balaam seeing as though he set a stumbling block before the children of Israel. So he could not curse them, but he could put a stumbling block in front of them. Right? So he didn't have the ability to curse them. Why? You cannot curse what God has blessed. But what I can do is set you up and put you in such a position and in such a way that you will offend your God. And if you offend your God, he will bring his own wrath upon you. He will bring his own judgment upon you. Now, when we talk about what is the error of Balaam, what Balaam caused him to do was he caused him to stumble into sexual immorality. <clears throat> he literally caused him to stumble into sexual immorality. Yeah, 2.14. Revelation 2.14? Read it for me. <coughs> but I have a few things against you because you have there. I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So there you have it. <clears throat> he didn't have the ability to curse them 
But what he did know is the understanding of what will cause God to turn against them. And what was the thing? What they consumed in sexual immorality. So much so that even Paul tells us in the New Testament, the food is for the body and the body for food, but God will destroy them both. He said food was created for the stomach and the stomach was created for food, but God will destroy them both. So God is very serious about what we put in our mouths, but God is also very serious about how we possess our vessels. When I say how we possess our vessels, what we do with them. Now, obviously, when you're talking about this trap of sexual sin, I'm trying to be mindful before we get too further down the road. And also, I, I want to just preface this real quick because somebody said earlier, like, hey, man, it's going to be like BET Uncut. Not quite. Right. Because <laughs> even still, you can proclaim a thing and just because it's right, still be unclean. Right. So although we're going to be truthful, we're going to be righteous in how we express things. We're not going to be lewd. We're not going to be raunchy. Amen. We're going to be righteous even in our expressions about things. But we're going to talk about some very real things, but we're going to be righteous about it. We're going to be holy with our speech. Our words are going to be seasoned with grace. Amen. So if you're looking for just a nasty show, this isn't the place. But if you're looking for freedom and for words that are seasoned with grace that brings true freedom where we can lay it out in a real way and really talk about it, that's where we're going to go. Amen? Amen? Excellent. So Balaam literally set a stumbling block in front of them. That stumbling block was that down in the valley, if you put these women down there, these men won't be able to resist themselves. Literally. He gave them the blueprint. This is what you do. You're going to take the women... You're going to take those foreign women and you're going to push it, position them there. Those foreign women who already do what they do will continue to do what they do there. When they behold it, they will not be able to restrain their vessels. When I say restrain their vessels, meaning keep themselves. Yes, we're going to be righteous by how we express things. Amen. Exactly right. They will not be able to contain themselves. And what happened? They gave themselves over to sexual immorality. Why? They could not stand to bear the look of those women. Now, if you understand what was really happening, these women were dancing provocatively. These women were dressing seductively. There was a lot of moving parts, right? So even when we look at our modern day society, all of those things are offshoots of what once was. When we look at the strip clubs, when we look at the music videos, all you got, I don't use TikTok, but all you got to do is open up your TikTok, the most righteous man going to be subject to a twerking video. Like, you can't even avoid it at this point. Like, we're trying to cover and protect our children, and the more we protect them, the more they lose it, right? But even Balaam understood, these men won't be able to restrain themselves if you put it in front of them. It's one thing if they have to go get it. So this is the dynamic. You can't control what you see, but you can control what you look at. That's how my spiritual father taught me. You can never control what you see, meaning what gets set before you is one thing, but what you set your gaze upon is a totally different thing. You understand what I'm saying? For me to see you is one thing, but for me to set my gaze upon you, this is where the pornography comes into play. The pornea. We'll talk about that word and what it means, but this is where the pornography comes into play. Why? You set your gaze upon a thing. So what happened? He puts them down in there. Hey, this is what you're going to put these women down there. The moment they see them, they're going to set their gaze upon them. The moment they set their gaze upon them, they won't be able to restrain themselves. The moment they couldn't restrain themselves, God was like, okay, I got something for you. You see? And then God began to deal with them. But it was what they looked upon. So when we talk about the trap of sexual sin, the first thing you have to understand is you can't control what you see, but you can control what you look at. <clears throat> I tell every man of God, all you got to do is go to their for you page. That's it. Let me see, hold on. Every man of God, all you got to do is go to their For You page. You see that? What's on there? Guns and memes. I don't even have to look at it. I could just go for... What's, what's on there? No. Guns and memes. That's it. Why? Because I don't set my gaze on the thing that can cause me to fall. I don't set my affections on the things that are unclean. You see? So the first part when we talk about, 
avoiding the trap of sexual sin is you have to first possess your eye. You have to possess your eye. And in order to possess your, in order to possess your eye, you have to have a strong spirit. You have to have a strong spirit in order to possess your eye. Because there's different facets when we talk about sexual sin that are working. You have the facet of the flesh, which will only do what the soul tells it to do. You have the facet of the soul, which is who you truly are. And then you have the facet of the spirit, which is leaning towards God for everyone who's amongst us. The people on this live and the people here, our spirits are joined with his spirit because we're one with the Lord. So our soul is truly who we are. Our spirit doesn't get involved in that. Our soul is the one that leads us when we, now not us, but meaning those who are dealing with the trap of sexual sin being ensnared by it. It's your soul that's not willing to turn to the spirit so you don't look upon the unclean thing. That's what he said. Do not touch the unclean thing. Do not handle the unclean thing. Do not look upon the unclean thing. So what happens is most of us do a good job with not touching and not handling, but we don't do a good job with not looking. But the problem is looking upon the unclean thing causes you to touch and to handle. You see? You look upon it, excuse me, you look upon it, and then you begin to touch and handle it. But the man who's willing to possess his eye will set his affections on greater pleasures. This is why I tell the people with me. There's a greater affection and there's a greater pleasure, and that pleasure is in the Lord. So I look to him. So when we say things like, hey, look to God, look to the Lord, there's so much behind that. It isn't just a catchphrase. What am I saying? Possess your eye in what you set its affections upon. Because the moment you set your affections upon it, it can capture your gaze. You see? Not you gaze upon it. It captures your gaze. When it captures your gaze, you become prisoner to it. This is for the men and the women. Yeah. Right? So what do we do? We love the movies with the man where he doesn't expose himself, but he has that beautiful six pack mm -hmm. and that strapping chest. But you don't realize you're in a snare of sexual sin. Also, why your gaze is set upon it. Mm -hmm. So and I'm going to teach about this as we're going along. But fornication, immor sexual immorality, fornication, homosexuality, sodomizing, effeminacy, all these different dynamics. Right. Sexual morality is the house. Inside of that house is homosexuality, sodomy, because they're two different things. That's why they had to classify them. Idolatry, fornication, pervert, all these things are inside of that house. But the person who doesn't have possession of their eye, they're inside that house wandering around, don't know they're about to go into a trap door. You're inside that house wandering around, not knowing you're about to literally fall into a trap door. You understand? So there was a um, there was a kind of a spill through uh, the internet, world, the social media worlds, where people were talking about sex before marriage, right? And is sex before marriage le legal? Is sex before marriage? You know, there was this big thing about it, right? And a man of God got caught into a tizzy because he said some things, and obviously some pieces got taken out of context, and there was greater context to it. However. I was talking with Sean this past weekend and we we're talking about it because the man of God told him, he said, another man of God, not this man of God I'm speaking about, but someone else told him, well, you know, fornication isn't a sin if you choose to marry. Right. And I told him, I said, I want you to know that's a doctrine of demons and you should err from it and run from it as fast as you can. I said, however, when we look at the definition of fornication, there are some things that aren't listed specifically under that definition. So what happens is in order for man to then say, let me find my way and make my positioning for my unrighteous heart. Oh, see, well, this doesn't fall under that line, so I can do this. That's one thing, but it's all housed up under that sexual immorality, fornication, idolatry, perversion, all of that sodomy, homosexuality, all of that is under the house. So no matter what, you're still in deep doo-doo because you're inside of the house that you're supposed to flee from. You understand? You literally ran inside of a burning building. He said that no man, seeing as though he could possess a fire into his lap and then take fire into his bosom and not get burned. Excuse me, my voice trying to go out. 
I should be like, come on, pray, saints. Come on. <laughs> right. But literally, all of that is housed under that sexual immorality. So I wanted to deal with that quickly right off the bat. Sex before marriage is a sin. Sex outside of the context of marriage in any way is a sin. So if you don't get nothing else, understand you do not want to be inside of the house of sexual immorality. Yes. Why? You will set yourself against your God. The children of Israel were messing up, but when it came to sexual immorality and eating things that were given to idols, God takes no delight in it. Mm -hmm. And Balaam knew this is the one way I can get God to turn against them. So God didn't curse him, but I can show how God will curse them. So now that we understand that, we're going to get into generational curses in a little bit. All those different things. People have generational curses chasing down their bloodline so deep trying to figure out what happened to my children. God is against your great grandfather. And that thing is rolling downhill, let alone what you did also. So we have to learn this right here so we can course correct the generation. So even when we talk about the trap of sexual sin, that's why it's such a fight within the school system and within the government system for policy and for education. Policy and education. Policy and education. I'll say that again. Policy and education. That's why it's such a fight. Because why? Anytime sanctioned sexual immorality, anytime sexual immorality has been sanctioned as a nation, God is against that nation as a whole. If you look within the scriptures, what he say? I'm going to take you into the land. The women that are in that land, do not join yourself to them. If you join yourself to them, this is what will happen. We see that happen with Solomon. It wasn't about Solomon having many wives. It was about Solomon having the wrong wives. It was about him joining himself to the wrong wives. Why? Because with the wrong wives, they will bring their gods. And when they bring their gods, it will become sanctioned within a nation. So even with our nation, policy and education, that is the biggest trap for sexual sin for the generations to come. Why? If we can make policy that accepts the ABCD community, and when I say alphabet community, hoping you can understand what I'm trying to say, right? Because we can't say that without violating. You understand what I'm saying? So within policy, they want to enlarge the alphabet community. You ever notice the letters just keep increasing? Mm -hmm. it's, not about let it's not about being inclusive and including things. It's about sanctioning sexual immorality within a nation. Then education. Why? If we can get the children to behold it, they will begin to be at war within their members regardless of what they're taught at home. Regardless of what they're taught at home, they will war within their members because of what they're beholding. So you raise them and you teach them in the admonition and fear of the Lord, but then you set them before everything that's unclean and they begin to war within their members. Just like Balaam taught them. Hey, just put them down there. Just... You don't even have to just leave the women down there. They won't be able to restrain themselves. And then we send our wonderful little babies off and say, hey, go ahead, restrain yourself. So policy and education. There's literally a song in the alphabet community where the lyrics say, we are coming for your children. Wow. Wicked. Wicked. So sanctioned sexual immorality is what the enemy desires for a nation. If it's sanctioned as a nation, that's what America's up against right now. The sanctioning of sexual immorality. If it's sanctioned, a nation will fall. A nation will fall if it's sanctioned. I was talking with Sean about this because Sean is Kenyan. And I said, you know, one thing I love about my brothers across the water is that they don't have these, they don't have these, these spats. They may have some other things, but this right here is a named among them. What did the guy say on the thing? Why are you gay? <laughs> you know what I mean? Who said I gay? You are gay. <laughs> right? That right there isn't common amongst them. Why? Because it's not sanctioned. If it's sanctioned, you yourself have to come under it also, even though you don't partake in it. This is why politics is important. You understand? This is why men of God being in the right place is important. This is why we need the Davids and we need the Daniels and we need the Jeremiah's. This is why this is important. 
So back to you can't control what you behold. This is what happens within a nation. So he likened Israel to a whore who would sleep against around her lovers. That's what he likened the nation to. You're a whore who slept away from your lover. Why? They couldn't control what they would behold. And if they beheld it, they were given over to it. So if you don't get nothing else tonight, if you control and possess your eye, you can keep your members. You understand what I'm saying? And when I say keep your members, hopefully we can put our spiritual hats on and understand what our members are. Our entire vessel. And everything that can work within it and come from out of it. Amen? Yeah. All right, excellent. Now let's go to, um, I want you to help me, let's go to 1 Kings 15, and I'm going to get a, a different scripture right after that. YouTube, are y'all still with me? I have a different way I'm putting the, uh, the chat on the TV, so I can't, it's not on the iPad where I can see it as easy, so I want to make sure y'all are good. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. This isn't going to be one that make you shout. This is very sobering. Very sobering, but it will, it will help us as a whole because each one of you has people that you can reach that I can't reach. And each one of you will be able to help shift the tide and trajectory of those around you. Amen. First Kings 15. I'm going to find which one I want you to read, then I'm going to go to where I'm going. I want you to read verse chap, uh, chapter 15, start at 9. And I want you to go to 14. But actually take your time when you read this one. Okay. First Kings 15, okay. verse 9 okay. through 14, right? 14. But take your time when you read it. Thank you, Lord. In the 20th year... Thank you, Sean. Of Jerobo Jeroboam. These words going to throw him off and throw us off. So just, just get with it, okay? King but we know Israel. what he's trying to say. <laughs> Azra became king of, over Judah, and he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Mecca, the granddaughter of Abisholam. As a did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. And he banished the perverted person from the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Also, he removed Masha, his grandmother, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asher cut down her a seen image and burned it by the brook Kendar. Perfect. You got it in the Amplified? Put it in Amplified and read that same thing. But just read 12, just read 12 through 13. He expelled the male cult prostitutes, sodomites, from the land and removed all the idols that his fathers, Solomon, Rehoboam, and Abijam, had made. He also deposed his great grandmother, Mecca, from being queen mother because she had made a horrid, obscene, vulgar image for the goddess Esherah. Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it by the brook. Thank you. So that I don't YouTube. I hope you guys could hear. But did that scripture come a little more to life when he read it? Yeah. Right. And I love our most wonderful inspired KJV. This is my favorite. But sometimes we can get a better context of what's happening here. So Asa did was right. What was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father, David. And he banished the perverted persons from the land and he removed all the idols that his father had made. So it tells us here that the perverted people that were in the land, these were sodomites, prostitutes, and whores. He dismissed them from the land. The reason they were there in the land was because of the images that they built. 
the images that they built were monuments unto fallen spirits. Literally. There were images after fallen spirits. And they built them and set them before the people so they would set their gaze upon them. When they set their gaze upon them, now inside of the land you have sodomites. Now inside of the land you have whores. Now inside of the land you have prostitutes. All because of what they're beholding. Now remember, if you go back, I taught you in Genesis 6 about the sons of God and how they came and took the daughters of men and began to mate with them. That wasn't that they just made it with them, but they raped them. When it says that they took wives, it means that they said, you belong to me, and they forced themselves upon them. Right? When they forced themselves upon them, now remember, these men were men, the men that they created were what we call men of renown, right? Mm -hmm. However, these fallen spirits were massive in size. Mm -hmm. Massive in size. So they parade about themselves in a way projecting, look at who I am. Look at what I possess. You understand what I'm saying without having to say it? Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to teach you where this comes from. Anytime the pride and the sanctity in your members is not for the privacy of the bedroom, you're under the influence of a fallen spirit. Literally, anytime you parade about what God has given you outside of the sanctity of your bedroom, you're under the influence of a fallen spirit. You're under the influence of a demon. Demons are fallen angels. So demons, spirits are not the same thing. Right. So when we talk about casting out demons, devils, unclean spirits. They're not all the same thing. The demons are literally the fallen ones. The ones that possess a body. The ones that possess a body don't need to enter you. Why? They have a celestial body. They have no need to enter you. The ones that don't need a host or something to house them. That's why what did they say? Don't cast us out. Send us into the pigs. Why? They need a host to house them. You understand? Yes. So, the flauntings of one, the flaunting of one's members... If it's outside of the sanctity and the privacy of one's bedroom, you are under the influence of a fallen spirit. Not only are you under the influence of a fallen spirit, you are given over to idolatry in ways you don't even understand. This right here is what that was about. They made carven images in the likeness of these fallen spirits. And when men behold them, they can't control themselves. And then what do they do? They become sodomites and they become homosexuals and they become all of these other things. You understand? But I'm teaching you the influence behind what the culture thinks is normal is not normal. So even when we talk about the bedroom being undefiled, it's pure because of its privacy and its sanctity. But when you bring the world's ways to it, you don't know what inspired the world to bring that about. You understand? And I told you I would teach you things that You've probably heard, but there's a lot of things I know you haven't heard. Most people don't know that every one of those members that gets paraded in that way are the influence of fallen spirits. Demons. 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 Literally, most people don't know that. I just fell out my seat on purpose. <laughs> you crazy, Ty. You crazy. So, I'm just helping you understand what you're reading. Because a lot of times you can read through something. How many times have you read it and just didn't even know that's what was going on? You just thought, that, oh, they were just banishing idols from the land. No. These idols were carved after the images of those fallen spirits that they had seen. Parading themselves and they were given over to them. We're going to talk about masturbation in a little bit. But every person who masturbates ministers to Baal. Most people don't know that. Every person who masturbates, they minister before Baal. And they're a servant of Baal. Yep. So verse 13, so he, he banished the perverted persons from the land and he removed all the idols that his father had made. Also, he removed Macha, his grandmother, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah and Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook Kidron. Now, John, help me. I want you to get Second Kings 23. What culture thinks is normal is not normal, guys. I want you to understand that. The culture has been swaying you for years and you didn't even know what was the spirit behind it. The ancient ones, the fallen ones. 
looking at you give yourself over to their ways. Okay, I'm gonna I'm share this with you. Okay. Let me just see how far we wanna rip. It shapes the mind, it does. And the mind is the most active part of the soul. So if they can shape the most active part of the soul, they can direct you about which way they would have you to go. Not which way God would have you to go. Amen? Hmm? Even for the woman? E say it louder so they can hear you. Even for the woman? Yes, that goes for the women also. No, 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 do your thing. Now, now, my wife just said, my wife said, does that go for the women also? And in regards to breast implants, BBLs, and all those kind of things. I can tell you, as for me at my house, my wife's not getting nobody's BBL, okay? Amen. Amen. <laughs> all right, Saints? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm picking, I'm picking. However, that right there also is one of the things where the influence behind it, if it's not pure, mm -hmm. I think it's good if a woman desires that she would like to see herself in a certain measure, in a certain way, in a certain, how she would, that would give her confidence and boost her, those kind of things, that is totally acceptable in the eyes of God. However, if the influence is unclean, you've now mutilated your members in about a way that's a sacrifice unto an idol. You understand the difference? If it's genuine that this is what you desire, so forth and so on. A BBL is a Brazilian butt lift. Can you describe slash explain sodomy? I was going to get there in a little bit. But sodomy is what we call sodomizing. Sodomizing is the penetration of the body part that's not supposed to be penetrated. You have one on you and you have to wipe it and clean it. We're going to go there in a second okay. because, but I, I, w I will help you understand. So I, I will help you understand. My wife said, so married people shouldn't do this. She's skipping ahead of the class. So However, <laughs> I want you to understand something. Paul separated sodomizers from homosexuals. Mm -hmm. He classified them. You, you, hear, you hear me losing my voice? Mm -hmm. He literally classified them. Sodomizers mm -hmm. versus homosexuals. So an homosexual can practice sodomy, but a heterosexual can also practice sodomy, which makes them a sodomizer. <coughs> Excuse me, you guys. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to go there in a second, but I wanted to answer that. Second Kings, uh, what chapter did I tell you? Uh, Second Kings chapter 23. 23, thank you. Go to verse, um, let's do 13. No, do 12 and go to, to 15. The altars that were on the wolf, roof, the upper chamber of Azar, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, the king broke down and pulverized there, and threw that and threw their dust into the brooks Kendor. Then the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, which were on the south of the mount Mount of Corruption, with the Solomon king of Israel. Have built for Asra the abomination of the Sidonians, for Chemosh the abomination of the Moabs, and for Melcom the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he broke in pieces the scare pillars and cut down the wooden image and filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel. In the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, who made Israel sin, had made both the altar and the high place, he broke down, and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. 
Perfect. Can you read that in Amplify? Yes, sir. I can read Amplify as well, too. Oh, you got Amplify? Yeah. Okay. No, you good. Let him read it because he has the mic. I didn't know you could switch yours that fast. He's going to read this in the Amplified. Yes, this is going to stay up. We're not taking it down. The altars dedicated to the starry hosts of heaven, which were on the roof, the upper chamber. Right, now stop of there. So now the altars that were dedicated to who? The starry hosts of heaven. Remember I told you there's influence behind these things. Those things that were built were in light of what they had seen at one point in time. The altars that were built in light of the starry host of heaven. Go ahead. The upper chamber of Hazar, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courtyards of the house of the Lord. The king tore down, and he smashed them there, and threw the dust into the brook Kendar. Mm -hmm. The king desecrated the high places which were opposite east of Jerusalem, which were on the right south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Asra, the repulsiveness of the Sidians for Chemosh, Chemosh. Yep, that's right. the repulsive, repul repulsiveness of Moab, and for Melchon, the repulsiveness of the sons of descendants, of a Amon. So when it says here, I'm just teaching you guys, when it says that he built this for Ashtaroth, and then it goes on how he built this for Chemosh, and then he built this for Milcom, these are fallen spirits. Mm. Only men who have interacted with the spiritual realm and understand angels can understand who those men are. These are fallen spirits. These aren't just false, you know, like these aren't just kings in the earth that we like, oh, this and this and this and this, right? No, Milcom, that's a fallen spirit. That's an angel of light who rebelled against God. Mm -hmm. You understand? Ashtaroth is a celestial being of light who rebelled against God. Chemosh it was a spirit of light who rebelled against God. So when it talks about the host of heaven, this is what they're building these things after. And when man beholds it, he can't contain himself. Mm -hmm. Why? The powers that be with inside of it will cause you to lose control. You understand? Mm -hmm. This is why... He's making desecration of it, right? He isn't just he isn't just cutting it down. He said that he took the powders and threw them into the brook. This means he brought this down to nothing. You understand? Yes. Every idol in your life has to be brought to nothing. If it's broken in half, it can be resurrected again. You understand? It's gone beyond the physical to the spiritual and become more intense by the flesh. That's right. Will also slap my knees <laughs> and call me Skip. I would have skipped over that. That's right. Amen. Well, it's not that you would have skipped over it. Men of light bring you to higher light. Men of the truth bring you to greater truth. Men of understanding bring you understanding. You understand? It's not that you would have skipped over it. It takes another man to unveil it to you. Now you have it and you give it to somebody else. Yes. All right. So uh, pick back up 14, please. Thank you. He broke in pieces the scare pillars. The sacred pillars. Oh, sacred pillars. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cultists, memorials, stones, images, and cut down the ashram and replaced them with human bones to desecrate the places forever. Excellent. Josiah was that, was that dude. If you ever want to finish the enemy, you have to desecrate his ways in your life. It's not enough to just cut it off. You have to defile what the enemy tries to defile you with. Yes. You understand? Okay. You have to desecrate yes. the altars of the starry host of heaven. Yes. And I'm telling you, when you scroll TikTok, you're beholding the altars of the starry host of heaven. Yes. When you scroll Instagram and your For You page, you're beholding the starry host of heaven. When you watch the movie, and they decide to defile you, you're beholding the image of the starry host of heaven. And as long as they set it before you, they know within enough time you will give yourself over to it. That's why you have to choose violence and make violence against this like Josiah did. Bring the starry host down to powder. May every altar of the enemy be desecrated. 
May every high place be brought low. You understand? Yes. Excellent. So this is where we see when when it talks about that, there was more moving parts that doesn't that isn't expressly stated. But if we started reading the Message Bible and some other things that give you more understanding, there were shrines, and within these shrines was where prostitution would take place. The prostitution was how they would give an offering to their God. You understand? So even those who partake in that, they think they're just getting their rocks off. They're ministering at the altar of a fallen spirit. Every form of sexual immorality, because sexual immorality, remember I said it's the house, but then there's different ways by which you can express that immorality. Every expression of immorality is a form of idolatry that is tied to a fallen spirit. Every form of sexual immorality, every expression of sexual immorality is a form of idolatry that's tied to a fallen spirit. You understand? Yes. There are people that administer before Beelzebub, they didn't know it. Mm. There's people that administer before Baal, they didn't know it. There's people that administer before Abaddon, and they didn't know it. Right? Because remember, these are ranks. I'm giving you ranks. I just told you about Chemosh. I just told you about Ashtaroth. I just told you about Manash. All of these are ranks. Beelzebub. Oh, how does he do this? Oh, he does this by the prince, Beelzebub. Beelzebub's the second in command. That's why he's the prince. Is it? Yes. He said, how does, how does he do this? Oh, he does this by the prince of the spirit of Beelzebub. They understood who was in rank and order there. Beelzebub is second in command. And, I, you know, that's a different class. So just a shameless plug. If you want to learn more, you're going to want to come to Washington, D.C., September 22nd to 24th for glory and power. It's going to be fantastic. All right? <laughs> Excellent. Now, segueing, because I don't want to spend a lot of time on the starry host of heaven and those kind of things. I just wanted you to know that every expression of sexual immorality is tied to a fallen spirit. Every single expression, every expression is tied to a fallen spirit. And not only is it tied to a fallen spirit, but it's tied to you kneeling before that altar to bring your sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And when you bring your sacrifice, they tie themselves to you and now they beckon you and call you back spiritually. Mm -hmm. So some people, they get free, right? Remember I said deliverance is the beginning. Now we got to walk this out. Mm -hmm. Cast the devil out you is one thing. You go three days, you've been doing well, but all of a sudden you get this tick in this itch. You don't realize that celestial power has you tied up in the spirit and he's beckoning you to come back and minister at that altar. Do you see what I'm saying? He's calling that chime, playing that siren sound. And you don't even realize why you're being drawn away. He's like, I don't, what did Paul say? I find myself doing the thing that I don't want to do. Your flesh has now become a disciple of the fallen spirits. Literally. Your flesh has become a disciple of the altar of the fallen spirits. And they're calling you back unto them. Okay? So make war against these things is what I'm saying. These things aren't light. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I hope this is blessing you so far, YouTube. YouTube, are you with us? Flesh, yes, it's true. Howard Rose, God bless you, man of God. Hey, Marissa, I love you. Lord, I repent of every known and unknown perverted altar I have sacrificed to known and unknown. Amen. Now, here's the, ki here's the kicker. Most times when people don't understand about the altars is you don't always have the power to break yourself free from an altar. Because remember, spiritually, the way we, do, the way we deal in this realm is with our word. I've taught you that. The way we interact on this side, because even this side is spiritual, right? So this body is fleshly, right? But most people don't know that this body is also spiritual. Why? Because in the day of the return of our Lord, this body will resurrect. This body has spiritual nature within it also. That's why it has the ability already within it to resurrect. Yes. You see? So even, in, even inside of this realm, it's spiritual, although it's not. It's ex exclusively and extremely spiritual. Now, when we talk about that, the next thing I want to kind of help us to understand is overcoming lust. Mm -hmm. Overcoming lust. Because the word of God says that we are drawn away by lust. Mm -hmm. 
we're drawn away by lust. So lust is something that can pull us towards God or pull us away from God. Now listen to what I said. Lust is something that can pull us towards God or pull us away from God. Yes. You'll never, you, you typically won't hear men of God say, oh, lust, lust like this. However, there's a lust of the flesh. There's a lust of the eyes. What do you say? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the deceitfulness of riches, right? That's in John. Mm -hmm. But then Paul talks us in Galatians. Let's, uh, I'll read this one. Galatians, uh, which is that beautiful? Oh, <laughs> let's talk about it. Amen. Five. There is no Galatians seven, apparently. So. <laughs> now it uh it scrolled back so quick. I don't know. Do I have the ability to scroll through the chat with this? No. I thought I saw my big brother Paul say something on there. Either way, I want to give a shout out to my big brother Paul and Carmel. I love you deeply. Can't wait to see you in South Florida in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm just blown away at the fact that people discredit the Old Testament in such a crazy way, but the cross references are there. Yeah. Jesus wasn't the doing away with it, he was the fulfillment of it. Yes, sir, I'm worthy of this brother, this version. Amen. So let's go to Galatians five. But we're going to start with 16. And I want you to read. I'm going to read it, but then I want you to read it and amplify it. Now, talking about lust. I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he gives us a wonderful list here, and that list isn't exclusive. Yeah. So he said that all of these things and the likes. Yeah. So meaning it's not an exclusive. What happen people do, you, you look at that list and they say, well, this falls outside of that. But the problem is he said, and the like. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, when we scroll back up, he says, oh, no, you read it real quick. But, John, I want you to just do 15, 16 and 17. Okay. But I say, hey, walk up, habitually. Up. In the Holy Spirit, seek him and be responsive to his guidance. And then you will certainly not carry out the desire of the sinful nature, which responds impulsively without regard for God and his precept. For the sinful nature has its desire, which is opposed to the spirit. And the desire of the spirit opposes the sinful nature. For these two the sinful nature and the spirit are in direct opposite to each other, continuously in conflicts, so that you as believers do not always do whatever good things you want to do. Thank you. So he tells us here that there's a lust of the flesh. That lust of the flesh is against God's ways. But then he tells... Oh, okay. Thank you. Felicia interceding for y'all, okay? <laughs> now, he says, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. What that saying is truly saying is that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit lusts against the flesh. Mm -hmm. So everyone talks about the lust of the flesh, but they never speak about the lust of the spirit. Mm -hmm. There's a lust within the spirit that desires to draw you towards the things of God. That's why he said the two are opposed to one another. Right? He, 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 cl he clarified it. There's a lust of the flesh that is opposed to the desires of the spirit. What it's truly saying is that there's a strong desire of the spirit 
that is against the ways of the flesh. And as a strong desire of the flesh, that's against the ways of the spirit. Mm-hmm. Now that you're made aware, I'm teaching you that you have a spirit inside of you that desires and lusts towards the things of God. You have a spirit in you that lusts towards righteousness. You have a spirit in you that lusts towards purity. You have a spirit in you that lusts towards communion with the Lord Jesus. You have a spirit that lusts towards fellowship and union with the Holy Spirit through prayer and perfect intercession. But on the contrary, you have flesh, the old man, that lusts against the things of the spirit. You understand? Amen. Eve said obey the first time. Yes, that's right. So even in that, you have this thing that lusts against the spirit, but you have the spirit that lusts against the flesh. Why is it lusting against the flesh? It has deep desires. The spirit has deep desire. I'm talking about deep desire within the spirit, sweetie. The spirit has deep desires, but you only deal with the lust of the flesh. So that's all they teach you about. All oh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. But no one's ever sat time to sit down and tell you, hey, the spirit has deep desires. That spirit inside of you has deep longings for fellowship through the Holy Spirit. That spirit has deep longings for communion with God. That, that spirit has deep, deep desires for lusting towards God's ways. That spirit has the lust that says the things like I say. Every man, if he looks to God, the, if he looks to Jesus, the Father will be revealed. What I would say, hey, let us look to Jesus and he will reveal the Father to us. The spirit lusting taught me that. Wow. The spirit lusting taught me that. If you set your gaze upon me, I will reveal him to you. You see? Because remember, when Jesus came and interacted with me, I didn't know the scriptures. So what God did with me was totally different from a lot of people. A lot, definitely a lot of my peers in ministry, all of my, my, my spiritual father's counterparts, like... What he did with me was totally different. I didn't have any of this. But what? This, it didn't matter because the spirit lusts towards the things of God. Question. If the Holy Spirit is a person who is upon us and lives in us, if we're to be led by and walk in them, does this mean that sin, like Paul said, is at work in a person, like third person? Yes, Paul said that, O oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body of death? I find myself doing things that I don't want to do. Why? Your flesh has been discipled by the old man. That's why. Your old nature has discipled your flesh so long that you now have to let your flesh be discipled by your spirit. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the spirit will draw your flesh into being discipled by it. You'll never have another problem fasting. You'll never have another problem praying. You'll never have another problem giving. You'll never have another problem giving yourself towards the ways of God. Now, you will have to overcome. So I didn't say that it won't exist. But the spirit that lusts will cause you to ascend into the spiritual plane that you will overcome everything that the enemy puts before you. Amen? Amen. So there's a lust of the spirit. I just, I, I won't, that's a separate teaching, teaching on lust of the spirit. But I just wanted to at least put that framework out there so when we come back and we start talking about the washing of the word. And remember I said deliverance is at the beginning. Part of that process is teaching you about the lust of the spirit, yes. right? So you can now be renewed in your mind. A lot of you feel renewing in your mind just knowing that. Man, there's a lust of the spirit. The spirit has deep desire towards the things of God, but that spirit is inside of me. I have to get that to break forward, yes. right? So that's part of, that's going to be part of when we go through this process of renewing of the mind. Amen. Amen. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the spirit. Now, tying that into just this whole trap of sexual sin, when you looked at all of the altars that were being broken down, <clears throat> remember I told you they were connected to the starry host. All of those were given over to fallen spirits in the image and likeness of fallen spirits. And when I say spirits, I'm talking about angels because I know I said demons, devils, but the spirits are not all the same thing. I already know that. It's just the way I express it, okay? So that way nobody comes for me later. But in light of that, and Alberta, I saw you had a question. Put it in the chat in a few minutes because this thing is rolling fast, so I can't, um, I can't see it that quickly. 
But Tyreek Kennedy said, can you explain how this is connected to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you ascribe that which is of God, that which is holy, that which is pure, that which is upright, and you ascribe it to the devil. He said that, oh, he cast out devils by Beelzebub, right? So I, I can teach you about blasphemy. I had a difference of opinion with one of my spiritual father's leaders. However, this specific individual is known for deliverance. Now, I could have aired like everyone else and said, oh, man, well, that's what she do about witchcraft. But I'm not foolish. Why am I not foolish? I will never err against the things of the spirit. Why? Because to ascribe anything that is of God to the enemy is blasphemy. So you said, can I could explain? That's how it's connected. You ascribe that which is of the devil to the enemy is called blasphemy. No other way around it. Now, I don't get into the was it accidental? Was it on purpose? I don't get all that. You're going to find out in the life to come. Oh, yeah. I'm, just not willing, I'm just not willing to roll those kind of dice. You understand? I'm just not willing to roll those kind of dice. Remember I told you Beelzebub is the second in command. Mm -hmm. You would ascribe that which is holy unto him? Mm. Yeah, you're kind of done for, buddy. So, yeah. Just don't do it. How about that? <laughs> the best thing to say, man, I'm not certain. <laughs> hey, what, hey what, that, what that chart say? The more you mess around, the more you're going to find out. <laughs> Y'all seen that one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, don't go look at it. <laughs> don't go look at it because it's, it's not the cleanest. <laughs> You've seen it. <laughs> this is my chart right here. And right here we got this plot and you got this plot. So here a person wants to find out. But in order to find out, they gotta, we're going to come up here to our, our mess around line. See, the more you mess around, the more you find out. Don't treat your salvation like that. Amen. Amen. So understanding that when we're talking about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the spirit, when we talk about these fallen spirits and those images that were produced, right? It wasn't just that those images weren't, it wasn't just that those images were produced. Those images caused the other people to minister unto those altars. When they ministered unto those altars, this is where we get our prostitution from. This is where we get our seductive dancing from. Our dancing literally is the heritage of the ministration of those ministering before those altars, which are fallen spirits. Literally, you know, that's I put a joke and I said, hey, if you kind of mid twerk, if you kind of semi twerk to this, uh, you know, when I put it on Instagram, and I had the juvenile on that back that thing up. I, I say, if you kind of semi twerk to this is as funny as it was. That's a heritage of fallen spirits passed down from generations and it's still going today. Still going today. We'll look up in our children's age. It'll just be something different. It'll just be something different, but it's still there. So now understanding that the dancing the immorality, all those things, even the dressing. When we talk about the trap of sexual sin, even the dressing is influenced by that of fallen spirits. So much so, so I can't twerk for my husband. Anymore. No, you got you, you. It's absolutely right that you twerk for your husband, but it's in the sanctity of your bedroom, in the privacy of your marriage. So don't tell us no more, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Because you're my sister in Christ, and I don't want to think that way. <laughs> I'm just picking with you. I love you. I'm just picking. But even down to the dress is influence behind. What is the thing behind why you want to present yourself the way you want to present yourself? Right? What is the influence behind why you want to present yourself the way you want to present yourself? You have to ask yourself that. Is culture driving me or is it the spirit of ancient ones who have fallen behind that culture that's influencing me? Ask yourself that. What was the, we watched the documentary half, we didn't even get through it with the fall of the pastor. Remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I won't say the name out loud, yeah. but you remember we watched it and the man had all his, he had all this stuff out there, just whisper in his ear. But the man had all, he just, he was exposed in all kinds of ways. It was something influencing him to present himself in that way. There was something influencing him to parade himself in such a measure. You understand? So understanding that, this is why men fall based upon why, how women present themselves and vice versa. So when I say men, I'm classifying gender because women came from out of man. So if I say man, it covers man and woman, okay? Yeah. Just to clarify that. He said that he called them and he named him male and female. So... They came from out of one. So I'm classifying both whenever I say that. Amen. Okay. 
just so I don't have to go back and forth. So I don't want the women to feel like, well, he ain't deal with the men and da 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 da. No, I'm talking about everybody. Man as creation. But when we talk about man as creation, this is why even in those altars, even as they ministered to those starry hosts, even before those different things, they had to present themselves and dress a certain way. They couldn't just wear their, their normal garments and do that. They had to present themselves a certain way. Get Proverbs 7 for me. Proverbs 7 is 6 and 7 is about the heart. I want you to find that for me. At the risk of asking a one-on-one question, would you know you whether you blaspheme the Holy Spirit even if ignorance before Jesus decided to keep you working? I believe you would know, Kevin. I do believe you would know. No, I'm okay. It's just, I just know what it is. I'm okay. You guys just work through me with my voice. I'm okay. Lord have mercy. Everything is starting to make sense. You what got proper. What you want, six or seven? Um, start with seven and. Do, where does it start talking about the harlot how she comes out of her house and says my husband is gone from his work or he's out on business and draws him away and then they should talk about her attire how she presents herself uh it's five okay let me read it with you youtube y'all still good i want to make sure y'all okay with this but I'm also not willing to rush through this. I'm not willing to gloss over it, but I want to make sure you guys are okay with this. Go ahead, John. Okay. Actually, I got it now. Go to six and yeah, read it through 10. However, I want everyone, this is Proverbs six, uh, seven. If you're writing notes, write Proverbs chapter six and seven. Read, the, read it in its entirety. We're just for time's sake going to pull out certain things, but read it in it, read it in its entirety. Proverbs chapter six and Pro Proverbs chapter seven. Amen. Okay, go ahead, help me out, John. For at the window of my house, I look out through my lattice, and among the naive, the inexperienced, and gullible, I saw among the youths a young man lacking good sense, passing through the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and there a woman met him, dressed as a prostitute and sly and cunning of heart. She was boisterous and rebellious. She would not stay at home. Perfect. At times, she was in the streets, at times in the marketplaces, lurking and setting her ambush at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. And with a bizarre and imprudent face, she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows. So I came out to meet you, that you might share with me the feast of my offering. Diligently I sought your face, and I have found you. And I have spread my couch with coverings and cushion of taspers, with color fine linen of Egypt. Egypt, I have prefer, perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our full, our, our fill of love until morning. Perfect. So, when it says here, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon, this is spiritual language here. This is telling us that there is a scent that she has given off that will cause others to be allured by her. Mm. Now, when you understand dealing with spirits spirits have sense what you don't realize is that which when i told you about what you gaze upon what you look upon being in the midst of all of those things that i've set up until this point affect how you smell spiritually literally every person has a scent that's why sometimes when i'll be doing deliverance I would, it'll enter into my nostrils i'll know that person's been ministering at the altar of an unclean spirit because there's a certain scent to it right but if you look, you just walk past, man, that person smelled good. I'm like, well, they smell like trash, actually. Mm. <laughs> if you could smell by spirit. But remember I said one of the functions of the seer is that their entire head can discern. So if you close their mouth, that's what he said. I will shut the mouth of the prophets, but I will cover the entire head of the seer. Why? Because 
it's not only his mouth, he can hear. It's not only that he can hear, he can see. It's not only that he can see, he can taste. It's not only that he can taste, he can also smell. So it's time like, this ain't it. This ain't it. So there's more than meets the eye. There was a famous singer, and she said, oh, on and on, and on and on. Everybody know her, right? I don't want to say her name. But she made it very clear one day, and she talked about how she has a certain scent that will cause men to be paralyzed. If you get within my presence, you will smell it. She talked about it. She's a harlot. Why? Because she's trying to draw you away to minister at her altar, her God's altar. But on the flip side, the Lord has a scent. He says, come, let us be drawn away. The apples and their spices have now broken forth. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us go into the vineyards. Let us see if the tender grapes have blossomed and the pomegranates have begun to bloom. Why? There's a scent for the righteous also. So you have to say, Father, bathe me in your ways that I too could be perfumed to pour for you. You understand? But that deals with the lust. The lust of the spirit has a smell also. And when he comes, you smell it and you're drawn to it. You're drawn into the chamber of love. You don't get to go into the chamber of love without him calling you unto himself. You understand? And it will always be preceded by the smell of his beautiful aroma. Amen. The people out here using that pheromone spray stuff, yeah, they're crazy. They better stop. Is perfume purposely used as an attempt to obscure the scent? I don't believe in and of itself, no. I actually... I love cologne. I got Creed. I got all kind of stuff. I love cologne. But there are some dynamics to it where people are presenting themselves in a way with how they position themselves, even with their sprays and themselves, to do more than just smell nice. And I think hygiene is important, so I think you should present yourself now. I think you should smell good. I think you should take great pride in how you present yourself on behalf of yourself, on behalf of your family, and on behalf of your God, as long as you have the ability to, right? Don't be dusty and crusty. But also understand that scent is also spiritual. Amen. So then if we skip back up, she says, passing along the street near her corner. And he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot. What does that mean? She had the uniform on. That's what that literally means. She had the uniform of a harlot on. Now, here's one thing. It's one thing if women twerk. But if women start twerking in jeans, skirts that went down to the ankles, men wouldn't be as moved. Why? The attire is a part of the sacrifice. The attire is a part of the ministration before the altar. Literally. If women, if we scroll TikTok and they did the same dances in jeans, skirts, and jean jackets, we wouldn't be as moved. If they did it in choir robes, all of a sudden we wouldn't be as moved. Why? The attire requires a certain uniform to minister at that harlot's altar. So that's why he's telling us she had the attire of a harlot. That is what captured him. This is why you have to possess your eye. If you possess your eye, you may see it, but you would turn and not look at it. Remember, seeing and looking are two different things. It's one thing for you to see something. It's another thing for you to set your gaze over it. We love a good father correction. (laughs) Amen. Twerking in jeans, skirts, and jean jacket. <laughs> and that might be what it takes to get people to stop, you know. <laughs> I have wondered about using a pheromone with the intention for our spouse. I, like I said earlier, I think, I believe personally within the sanctity of your bedroom and within the sanctity and the pri. here's that word again, I said privacy and the confines of your bedroom I believe that's undefiled and pure. Okay, Becky? That's that's not from God. That's from me. Now, you have to take that and put it where you put it. Even Paul said that, right? He said, I write these things unto you at the commandments of God. Now, these other things, this is what I'm saying. (laughs) He made a clear distinction between the two. I'm making a clear distinction that I'm not saying God is for it or against it. However, I believe, I believe you'll be okay. Amen. 
Excellent. So even with the attire of a harlot, it's a part of the ministration process that draws men away, that calls them to be given over in that measure and in that way, right? Even when we look, and I'm not against bathing suits and all that stuff. I, you need to get your tans and all of that kind of stuff, right? But even there's certain dynamics behind it that go from you just needing a tan and you being crude. And that line between the two is the difference between someone who needs a tan and someone who's ministering at the altar of a fallen spirit. That's the difference. Question, is it possible for married people to partake in sexual immorality? Absolutely. That's why he classified the bedroom as undefiled because it can be defiled. So, yes. So how we dress matters. How we behold what others are wearing also matters. Right now, of course, people start to say, oh, well, you know, people are naked. In, but guess what? You're not in the middle of the jungle. OK, so we're not speaking to those individuals. You're not in a third world country that hasn't been civilized, that hasn't yet got the gospel. We're talking to people right here, right now, who have the ability to possess the members and clothe themselves about with righteousness and clothes. OK. In regards to sin, could someone continuously attract certain type of men or women if that spirit isn't dealt with? Absolutely. Absolutely. You will continue to attract. I know someone like that now. They say, why do I keep attracting these people? Why? Because you smell like a harlot. That's why. You don't know it. Why do I keep attracting this kind of person? And they don't, they're not sleeping around. They're not promiscuous. They're not out here doing kind of things. But why? It doesn't matter. They minister that at their altar. They have the smell of that on them. You have a barbecue when you make all the wonderful food and then what you smell like. What I tell you every time you cook? It smells like chocolate. Say, man, you smell great. Why? There's an aroma. So I'm telling John, he loves to cook. Whenever he hooked that grill up, I said, man, you smell fantastic. Why? It's getting into him. So then for a couple of days, your hair smells like it. Your beard smells like it. Your fingertips smell like it. Why? It's a scent. Because you did that service, that thing has been infused into you. So how much more so when you fornicate, be an idolater, be a homosexual, be a sodomizer, do all these different things, and you think you just get to go put some dove on and go about your way and spirits can't smell you. That's not how it works. Amen? Excellent. How would they have the smell on them if they're not being promiscuous? Well, I just answered that, actually. So I, I think you put your question before I, before I got to it. How would you get rid of it? Stay to the end of this teaching. <laughs> That garment of a heart, is that something that you wore against spiritually or the other specific steps? It's not necessarily that you wore against it spiritually. You literally, well, if you're asking in regards to you just having to see it, you just don't set your gaze upon it. You can't control what you look at, but you, you can't control what you see. You can't control what you look at. If that's how you're asking the question. Amen? But even then, so people try to classify like, oh, well, this is this and this is this. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how we would keep ourselves clad. Clad means what? covered right covered so even then people try to what did they say with the man in the tombs he's in the tombs and he's naked that was the young man but then when jesus cast the spirits out of him it says that they found that young man clothed and in his right mind so what does that mean when his mind wasn't right it affected how he dressed find that for can you find that for me please that's where, now you're going to have to do something with Google or Siri, but that's where the young man is in the caves and he's naked. And then when Jesus ministers to him, he's now in his right mind and he's clothed. Yes, Olu. That's correct, Olu. You too, give us a few seconds. He's looking up a scripture. Or Sean, if you could put it in there for me. I want the scripture where Jesus ministers to the young man and then all of a sudden he's whole and he begins to put clothes on. Sean, if you can put that in there for me, please. And just to give me an opportunity to eat a few grapes while they're finding it. Mm -hmm. Not to leave you. Mm -hmm. 
I'm coming to that. Okay. Mark 5, verse 15. Luke 8, 27. Oh. Let's read the one. Cause she, okay, read Luke 8, 27. Thank you, Sean. I remember you spoke on devil's love nakedness. Oh, amen. Yeah, that was before the YouTube days. You must have been around. Amen. God bless you. Yeah, that was before I was on YouTube when I spoke about that. Now, they were pissed off about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I said, sorry, who pissed at your grits? <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were hot about that one. All right. Now, when Jesus stepped out on the land, he was met by a man from the city of Gerasa. Yep, that's the one. Who were possessed with demons. For a long time, he had wore no clothes and was not living in the house, but among the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out with a terrible voice from the depths of his throat and fell down before him in dread and terror and shouted loudly, What business do we have in common with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I beg you, do not torment me before the appointed time of the judgment. Now he was already commanding the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him violently many times, and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he will break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the desert. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he answered, Legion, because many demons had entered him. They continuously begged him not to command them to go into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the mountain. The demons begged Jesus to allow them to enter the pigs, and he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd washed, washed down to the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the herdmen saw what happened, they ran away and told it in the city and out in the country. And people came out to see what happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind, mentally healthy, and they was frightened. Perfect. That's what I wanted right there. He was clothed and in his right mind. Anytime someone possesses and is willing to guard about gird about themselves with the garland with the garment of harlots, something's not right here. They're clearly under the influence of a spirit. We see it with this man. The moment he gets free, he decides it's probably good for me to put some clothes on. You see that? Now, he was in a cave, but that cave had no doors on it, which means he could have left at any time. He was in a cave that wasn't imprisoned, which means he could have left at any time, which means he could have put about clothes. Yet, while under the influence of those spirits, he did not wear any clothes. When you see this, you're seeing someone under the influence of fallen spirits. Why? They love to parade about themselves. They love to parade about their members. You understand? Excellent. So nakedness is never a thing when you talk about the trap of sexual sin. Nakedness, if you behold it long enough, will work itself through you in ways you don't understand. And you will find yourself given over to things that you don't understand. How, how did I get here? What you beheld. What you beheld. I have a built-in protection system because my wife is going to make sure anything we watch she's going to get through that thing so quick if it were to pop up now one we don't watch a lot of stuff anyway however in the event we watch something she would never let our household be defiled we would just skip the whole scene rather than that pop up why she's controlling how we possess our eyes you understand true proverbs 31 possessing her home that's not just financially. You understand? Possessing our home. Possessing our eye gates. The enemy putting tightness on me. If I were you, I would allow the lust of the spirit to draw me to be awake. Let me tell you why. I'm not sure who that is. But if I were you, 
one, I'm tired also. But two, these are, one, I don't do this often. I don't. I will, like, my grace is to teach you spiritual things, prophetic things, all kinds of stuff. When God brought us across my radar, I thought, okay, now you have to fight because you don't know the next opportunity that grace like this may come around again. You don't know. And I'm not sure who that is, but if you have children, you probably should fight that way your children can be free also. I don't even, I'm not even sure, but I'm, I'm just feeling that spiritually. It's probably most important for you to get right. That way your generation stand a chance. And I'm tired too. <laughs> right? I'm tired also. However, if we were to do something that was sown to the flesh, that we would find great pleasure and great joy in, we would find the willpower to stay awake. Mm-hmm. We'll find the willpower to stay awake. Remember, you can sow to the flesh or you can sow to the spirit. Mm-hmm. Right now, we're sowing to the spirit. It doesn't seem that way because you're listening to me, but you're literally storing up within the spiritual realms things that you don't even understand. Mm-hmm. Amen? So to the spirit, fight for your breakthrough, fight for your family, fight for your generations, whoever that is. I'm not sure of your name, but God bless you. I love you if you have to go. And it will be up here again, but that doesn't mean grace will be here again. I told that to someone today. I told Janika she wasn't allowed to invite this specific person and they weren't able to make it. And I said, the problem is I don't invite people. God has to put you in my heart to come here. John knows I could pack these meetings out with hundreds of people like this. I intentionally don't. Why? I only deal with the people God put into my heart. Because the people God put into my heart, I have grace to get them somewhere. So in this moment, there's grace to get people to freedom. I'm telling you scriptures that you've already heard, but you don't understand the spiritual dynamics that are working behind me. You understand what I'm saying? You don't understand the spiritual dynamics of the angels that are with me. You don't understand the spiritual dynamics of the faith that's being heard that will allow the miracles to be worked. Who is he that worked miracles? By the hearing of faith. You don't understand what you're sitting under. So I'm trying to teach you, and this, I don't know who that is, but you should be spiritual. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So what did I do? I say, hey, man, put them energy drinks in the refrigerator, and we get ready to cast some doves out, cracking things open. Amen? Amen. My spirit bears witness with that. Sensing Brother Jason, the Holy Spirit began to help me see it's beyond me, great and cursing for my generation. Actually, this is completely about generations. Most people think it's about the people here. It's completely about your children's children. That's what this is about. A nation not given over to sanctioned sexual immorality. A people of purity. That's what this, that's what tonight is about. Amen. So speaking of that, this is what we'll do. Because I'm tired too, but I'm here. I'm aware I'm serving at the same time. So I'm going to take a bathroom break and give people the opportunity to get a coffee, give people the opportunity to get a water, do something of the sort. You can put this, hit the switcher and put the other image up. And then we're going to come back because I'm going to tarry. And you know, I don't say stuff like that. Do I? But that's what we're going to do because this is important, okay? So let's just take a five minute. I'm going to use the restroom. Restore my levels of comfort. That's right. Thank you. My etiquette daughter is helping me. I'm going to restore my levels of comfort, and then we're going to jump right back into this thing with nakedness because this is important. Don't miss the moment. When Jesus walked past the disciples, he said, you follow me, you follow me, you follow me. If the one says no, they missed the moment, and they don't have a throne in heaven. They don't have a seat at the table. If Elisha doesn't understand Elijah standing in front of him, he continues to work his yoke and his plow of oxen, not understanding that God was raising him up as the next prophet. If you miss this moment, who knows what's attached to it? Amen? Excellent. I love you guys. Give me a second. I'm going to use the restroom. Yes. Let's have them be more spiritual. Everybody pray in the spirit. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Ushiki la ba kande le shiko la ba. Le shiki la ba kande le shiko la ba. Ushiki la ba kande le shiko la ba. Le shiko la ba kande le shiko la ba. Le shiko la ba kande le shiko la ba. Le shiko la ba kande le shiko la ba. Ushiki la ba kande le shiko. Rani bleku la ba, rani bleku la ba, rani bleku la ba, shakan de le shiko la ba, o shiki la ba, o shiki la ba, kan de le shiko, o shiki la ba, kan de le shiko la ba, o shiki la ba, rani bleku la ba, o shiki la ba, o shiki la ba, o bla kan de le Thank you. Alanda black handy le shikola ba Alanda beki la ba ka Go shikola ba Ile shikola ba ka Alanda beku la ba sa kandi le O shikola ba Le shikola ba Le shikola ba O shikola ba Le shikola ba O shikandi le kola ba Alanda beku la ba Lani beku la ba kande le shiku la ba Le shiki la ba Le shiki la ba Lani abla kande le shiku la ba Le shiku la ba Le shiki la ba kan Lani beku la ba kan Lani beku la ba kan Le shiku la ba O bla kande yo O bla kande le shiku la ba Le shiku la ba Nisi kila ba, la nebe kila ba, la ne, usi kila ba, la na bla kande reshi kula ba, reshi kila ba kan, la nebe kula ba, reshi kula ba, reshi kila ba, reshi ku, usi kila ba kan, reshi kula ba. Thank you, Lord. All right, let's crank this thing back up. Right, give me a second. Let me...
All right, perfect. We back. No, the video didn't go out. We were just taking the restroom break, Carl. May the fragrance of Christ come through our pores. Yes. Gordon, I'm going to come to that in a second. I got you. I told my wife, she, she, asked, she asked me that for you. I'm going to come to that when we get to Corinthians. Everyone, if you can still hear us, put a thumbs up in the chat. I want to make sure we're good. Because I see someone ask where we're still on break. If you can still hear me, put a thumbs up in the chat. And we'll, we'll kick this ball back down the hill. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. All right, let's rock. So what did we leave off, John? Nakedness? Yes, you were yes. reading with him in the tombs. So nakedness has never been a thing to parade about. The moment you see it paraded about, you can show me, I can show you, excuse me, someone under the influence of a fallen spirit. Literally, the moment you see it, you're looking at someone under the influence of a fallen spirit. And the culture would have you under that sway. Do I think it's fantastic if someone gets a sick pack? Go for it. Right? I think, like, so we're not diminishing things at all. However, I'm bringing light to you so you can see what things that make so subtle as the culture are something different. You understand? Carl Thomas, I think that might be something with your device. Just check and see that. Back out and come back in. That might be something with your device. Because I think we're good with God's grace. What about children in public and home? Um, I'm not sure, but I think it's normal. I mean, my kids run around naked. So that's not what I'm saying. Right? So don't take what I'm saying like from one end of the spectrum to the other. Right? I'm just showing you certain dynamics that can show you that you're quickly falling into a snare of sexual sin. That's all I'm doing. So I don't want you to take this and then say, oh man, I can't, I got to get in the shower with clothes on. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> right? I'm just making light. I'm making light. I'm making light with you. But I know a group of people who held that doctrine where well, they would shower with clothes on. I won't talk about the reasons why, but this, this is what I'm saying is, don't go too far to the extreme. You show me extremism, I can typically show you someone also under the influence of a spirit. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I allow the lust of the spirit to lead you into the things of God and also be a disciple because you want to worry about because somebody said, get your bond back over here. Right. <laughs> Amen. So we left off with nakedness, but nakedness is always a thing of shame. I don't want us to have to go read and die searching the scriptures, but when you look at David's men, there was an encounter where his men were captured. And then when the men were captured, they took the men and marched them about, but they cut the buttocks of all of their garments out. Literally, cut the buttocks of all of their garments out. Why? It was a way to shame them. If we marched them about this way with their hind parts exposed, it will bring shame and dishonor to them. Mm -hmm. But then, what happens? The culture says, we're going to wear our pants as far down as we can. Mm -hmm. Why? We embrace shame. The reason they embrace shame is they're under the influence of a spirit. Mm -hmm. You understand? Nakedness is one of the earmarks that you can show someone's been given over to the trap of sexual sin, and they are under the influence of a spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So now, because everyone's asking about what they can do in the marriage bed, apparently y'all worried about what's going to happen tonight. So let's go to Corinthians. <laughs> Amen. Amen. See, Sean be on it. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Come on, Sean. Thank you so much. First, that's, that's First Chronicles 19.4. They cut the garments out to show the buttocks, and it would be a way of shaming them. So practical. Yes. The things of the spirit are always practical just as much as they are spiritual. My spiritual father taught me that. If it ain't practical, it ain't spiritual. Until it's time to just be completely spiritual. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> when it's time to be spiritual, it probably won't be too practical. Go dip into Jordan seven times. 
wasn't that practical. It's practical to jump in there, but it was filthy. He said, there has to be more. There's plenty of other bodies of clean water. No, you go dip in the Jordan. Now, if you understand the Jordan, it's the filthiest river ever. But how do you get leprosy off someone? He defiled what was defiling him. Go get in that water. He desecrated what was defiling him. He understood spiritual law. That's something you can't go read in the book. He defiled what was defiling him. If I told you how to deal with certain things, you just say, that's, man, that's this. That's. Why? You can't wrap your brain around the idea or concepts of God telling the man to go do something like that. It's crazy how God begins to groom you before you even know it because I used to sag and somewhere down the road as a man, I stopped without having. All it. Amen. Glad you were led by the Spirit of God and just good character and morality. You got First Corinthians? Yeah. What's you got chapter 6? Can you go to chapter 6 for me? Yeah. And let's do... Let me go there because I'm going to read it too. You got the... Amplify. Amplify, thank you. Can you do... Everybody, this is First Corinthians six. Can you do um nine through eleven, and then I'm gonna do it, but in New King James, okay. please. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual immoral, nor adulterer, nor adulterer, nor perverseness, effeminate, nor homosexual, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor rivers, revivers, who Revive, words yep. are used as weapons to abuse, insult, hum hum humiliate, intimidate, or slander, nor swander will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God and search what some of you before you believe, but you were washed by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. You were sanctified, set apart for God and made holy. You were justified, declared free of guilt, guilty in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of our God, the source of the believers, new life and changed behavior. Amen. Thank you. Now, I'm reading the same thing, but in um, New King James, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. He's telling us here, don't be deceived because people thought that they would be able to inherit it while participating in these virtues. Okay? So he's telling us, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So now when we're talking about the trap of sexual sin, he tells us here, I want you to know that. No unrighteous will inherit the kingdom of God, but don't be deceived. And then he goes to explain specifically, but not exclusively, because there's others that are also not limited to this list. Remember I said that earlier when we went through Galatians, right? And of the likes. So this is that same thing like that. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Now, let's just start with that portion right there because we're dealing with the trap of sexual sin. The other parts are also important, but we're dealing with that first part because we're talking about the trap of sexual sin. He specifically differentiates fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, and sodomites. Which means that these all stand in a facet of their own. You see that? Because... Someone can be a homosexual and not be a sodomizer. Someone could be a sodomizer and not be a homosexual. Yeah. So when you ask me how can the marriage bed, what can you do? He tells you right here. Sodomites and homosexuals are two different things. 
and we went through what sodomites were earlier, right? So we don't, I don't want to have to explain that again. But he tells us here that no fornicator, no idolater, nor sodomite, nor adulterer, nor homosexuals can inherit the kingdom of God. And when you read the new King James, excuse me, when you read the King James version, he says that no effeminate. So do we understand what effeminate is? What is it? Carries himself in the likeness of the opposite sex. Not participates in the acts, carries himself in the likeness. You know, carries himself in the likeness of the opposite sex. Not participates in the act. That's totally different. The homosexual is the one who participates in the act. This person right here just carries himself in their mannerism or in their nature or in their likeness. Greedy, drunks, abusers, cheats. Yes, all of those are included, but I didn't deal with those because those specifically don't deal with sexual sin. That's the only reason I didn't continue that verse, but she's right. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. None of the likes. None of the likes. But we're specifically dealing with right now homosexuals, fornicators, idolaters, sodomites, effeminate. Excuse me. These likes. So when he says that no adulterers, no homosexuals, nor sodomites, Gordon, you ask what can be allowed within the context of the bedroom? Well, he tells us right here that homosexuals and sodomites are two different individuals, which means that you can sodomize your spouse. And although she agreed to it, you'll still be considered a sodomite and you won't inherit the kingdom. Mm. Come back to the chat now because that question kept popping up going, let's deal with it. Effeminate. Oh. Effeminate. Everybody got it now. Everybody had questions. Come on back in here. Everyone who had a question about the marriage bed, now I want to see you pop in the chat, okay? Because now I'm talking, to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to everybody, but I'm specifically about to help you. Everyone who had a question about marriages, that chat got real quiet, though, to Antoine. That chat got real quiet. My wife said, don't put your pole in the wrong hole. Amen. Were y'all on Instagram when I had to whisper to that girl? She said, she said, at what point can, um, Kelsey, if you in here, you need to come into this chat also. I'm going to come to that, Quentin. Don't let me forget that question. She said, at what point is kissing wrong? I said, you tell me at what point kissing is wrong. I want you to answer your own question. And she said, when you feel like you're about to jump their bones and, and you get the vibration, I said, well, you should never kiss anybody and start vibrating. So that's the first thing. <laughs> and then someone said, what does the Bible say when you, what does the Bible mean when you say, greet your brother with a holy kiss? I said, not the kiss that Kelsey's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I wish my wife could zoom in so we could say, don't kiss like Kelsey's kissing, right, man. Amen. <laughs> Kelsey, we just making light. We love you. God is going to do fantastic things with you. Kelsey just came out of Jehovah's Witness. Do you know the strength it takes to break that deception off of someone? The strength it takes to break that deception off someone. God sure is going to do something great with her. So I'm not worried about her asking her a question about kissing. We just had to beat that thing to ashes. <laughs> Amen. No, there's nothing wrong with being attracted to your wife's derriere inside of the bedroom. It's within the sanctity and the context of marriage. Just don't put the hole in the, the pole in the wrong hole. Okay? Because that's where you cross the line into what we call sodomy. You understand they had a whole city named after it. Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. Why? Let's find it for me. I believe that's Jude. Go to Jude or you look. That's what you do. On your Bible app, type in strange flesh. And it'll pull it up right. It'll pull it right up for you. Or Sean, find a scripture for me that talks about. And they were like the men of Sodom and they went after strange flesh. I'm about to wake these kids up. Why? What's wrong? Oh. 
Oh, being delivered. Amen. I, I copy. Yes. Because you being male, I'm just using you, Quentin, as an example. Read that for me, Jude 1 to 7. I'll come back to you in a second, Quentin. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the adjacent cities since then, since they in the same so now, way. Hold on one second. It's Sodom and Gomorrah and the adjacent cities. So everyone talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't just them. He said Sodom, Gomorrah, and the surrounding cities. But we have an entire city named after an act. Go ahead. Since they in the same way as these angels indulge in gross immoral freedom and unnatural vice and sensational perversity, they are exhibit in plain sight as example in undergoing the punishment of the everlasting fire. Keep up with those questions for me. What do you do if the marriage has been bed has been defiled? When we're praying after this, we're gonna renounce and we're gonna break every tie that was ministered to by the influence of what the world taught us. And it's done. The marriage bed is now pure. That simple. You repent and you become a first class citizen in God's kingdom. That simple. And you never do it again. Okay. No, but what I was saying was Sodom and Gomorrah is an entire city, but it's surrounding cities also. But it says in the New King James that these men like Sodom went after strange flesh. Strange flesh what? They were trying to not men on men wasn't enough. They said, man, we want the angels also. That's the strange flesh. Men on men isn't enough. We want the angels also. You understand? So, God didn't label them as homosexuals. He labeled them as sodomites. Mm -hmm. So, when I'm telling you, we have to understand that he separated them for a reason. If one spouse isn't okay with the sexual act, that they, okay, it went away. Put that question back again in like a few minutes. If one spouse isn't okay with the sexual act. Just save it for me because I, I don't want to answer that right now. Okay. So, what I was saying was, all of my people who are talking about the marriage bed, come on back in here. Y'all, I need y'all to stay in the chat because now I'm talking to y'all. Okay? When you talk about how can the marriage bed be defiled, easy. Bring any one of these things aside of it. You will not be an inheritor of the kingdom. Bring any one of those things inside of it. You will not be an inheritor of the kingdom. Now you, the marriage bed is undefiled. Within the sanctity of marriage. However, in addition to, remember I told you, those acts and those things that were learned, they were taught those things. Men didn't learn to sodomize on their own. They were taught sodomy. The same way those same fallen spirits taught men war, they taught men makeup, they taught men agriculture, they taught men everything we have today came by virtue of fallen spirits teaching men. Mm -hmm. All of the advancement. I always thought anything in the marriage goes. That's what the enemy wants us to think. Because if anything in the marriage goes, you can be a homosexual in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. If anything in the marriage bed goes, you can be a fornicator in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. If anything in the marriage goes, you can be an adulterer. If anything in the marriage bed goes, you can be a sodomizer. If anything in the marriage goes, you, in the marriage bed goes, you can be effeminate. That's not what that means. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. It's not what that means. That's why I named it the trap of sexual sin. That's a trap that you, you fell into. It's a snare that the enemy laid out. Ty, I'm not sure what your, uh, what your question was, but I think you said something about holes and poles. Ty, put your question back in the chat. Yeah, that's nothing. Nothing. No thumbs in the behind. None of that. I want you to know where, where you think that came from. Yeah, we're, now we're being we're just being true and honest we're just kind of I'm talking low for a reason but where do you think that came from it's the influence of fallen spirits that taught these things the influence of fallen spirits that taught these things so much so that it's passed down to this day to this day to this day it still exists
Hey man, God bless you, Becky. Canaanite behavior. Exactly right. I was taught that marriage is a big playground with high walls as long as it is between you and your wife only play on and with what you want by a Christian marriage counselor. That Christian marriage counselor is ill-informed. That Christian marriage counselor is ill-informed. And the reason I say ill-informed is because I don't know them, so I don't want to speak on them personally. Mm -hmm. However, anybody who listens to me, if you ever go say something differently, you're under the influence of a demon. Mm -hmm. And you are peddling the doctrine of demons. Would a, trans, would a transgender or cross-dresser be considered effeminate? I think you answered that question. Why would another male want to dress as a female and why would a female want to dress as a male? It's the influence of a spirit. And guess what? There's grace to free people. There was a young lady who messaged me yesterday and she said, since I found your teachings, I've left my homosexual relationships and it's been a hard walk and I know Jesus wouldn't keep me, but I'm believing for even more freedom. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I said, meet me on the teaching tomorrow. Grace is there. And when I come to Ohio, we're going to get you all the freedom you need. Mm -hmm. I told her, I said, you meet me in D.C. September 22nd to 24th, just by the way. <laughs> and then I said, when I come to Ohio, I'm going to meet you. Between this teaching, you coming to D.C., me coming to Ohio, you'll never deal with that again. You understand? So, yes, you guys, the marriage bed can be defiled. The reason it's defiled is because you add unto it that which was never supposed to be in it. You add to the marriage bed that which was never supposed to be in it. Why? The ways of the world. So many preachers teach that whatever the Bible doesn't expressly mention about sex and marriage, then it's up to your conscience. Unfortunately, that's just not the way it goes. Paul said, everything I did up until this point, I did in good conscience. Yet his conscience was wrong because Jesus had to come tell him, everything you've been doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. You understand? Paul, when he testified before the proconsul, he said, everything that I did up until this point, I did in good conscience. That means when Stephen was getting stoned and as he was holding the coats, watching Stephen get stoned, he watched and did it in good conscience. Mm. Yet when Jesus appeared to him, our wonderful king of glory and all of his light, he said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Why? The way that I've been trying to lead you to, the way that I've been trying to goad you, that's what the pricks is. It's a goad. It's a literal disciple tool. You discipline someone into the way. That's how they would do sheep. They would prod them. When they prod them, it would lead them into the way. I've taught y'all about being in the way, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it was. It would lead them into the way. When it would lead them into the way, that's what a prick is. That's why he said it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Why? I've been trying to lead you in the way this entire time and you've been bucking against it. But then Paul said, I did everything in good conscience. So all along, what? The lust of the spirit was trying to lead him to the things of God, but the lust of flesh was taking him away from it. You understand? So no, everything doesn't go. And everything isn't a by just your conscience. If your conscience was enough, Paul would have never sat by and watched Stephen get stoned. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Eve three says, what about all in marriage? All in marriage is acceptable. Now the song of songs, which is one of my favorite books. Most people take the song of songs and they diminish it down to sexual relations. The moment I hear people talk about the song of songs, they diminish it to sex. I know their, their, their love language with Jesus is like this. You show me a person who takes the song song and they just go straight to sex. I'll show you a person who has had no encounters with the Lord Jesus. Carnal at best. Does it apply? Absolutely. It is applicable. That's what he says. He says, I sat under her tree and her fruit was my delight. Right? He says, I will then go unto her clusters and they would satisfy me. I love the song of songs, but the problem is the song of songs is about my love affair with him, not my interaction with my wife sexually. It's about my conquest of him capturing my heart and me capturing him. Amen. But um, that question went away. But whoever that was, um, yes. Yes. And I think you should enjoy it. I think God gave you something that is wonderful and to be enjoyed. And I think it's, I think it's precious. And I think it should be cherished. And I think it's good. It's righteous. It's pure. And it's holy. 
Somebody asked him about Flat Earth. I talked about that in like the ancient of days or something like that. You just got to scroll back. But that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. So what I want you to do is recalibrate into the spirit. Because we're talking about the trap of sexual sin. The trap of sexual sin will find you if the earth is flat or if it's round. Mm. So it has no value into what we're talking about right now. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. No. What did I, I saw it, but I couldn't, it, it went what so fast. If one spouse desires to do something that the other spouse deems degrading, does that make, okay, perfect. They're devouring them, thus being sexually immoral. I don't believe that they're sexually immoral. However, there can be a level of devaluing, which this is where conversation needs to happen. This is where counseling needs to happen. I can tell you now, most people's problem is they need a counselor. They need, people, marriages need Christian counseling bad. I'm actually on a conquest to build a database of Christian counselors that are spirit filled, that truly like that, tr that what I talk, they understand. They don't, they, they don't have to teach what I teach, but they understand the things that I'm speaking about. So that way we can get people the help necessary all over because my wife and I talk to a lot of marriages and I just can't, I just can't help all of them. But yes. Yes, Andre, this is what you do. You send me a DM after this and we can talk about it. That's no problem. That's not a problem at all. I was just correcting you so you know how to function in the school of the spirit. We're in the school of the spirit right now. Let's stay in the vein that we're in. The moment you step outside of that vein, there's no grace there. The grace is for what I'm talking about right now. Even if we just say hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. There's grace for what's happening right now. You understand? I said, can we talk about how not just poles and holes, but also paint out days? Yeah. Really cool. Oh, yeah. I mean, one, it's just unsanitary. That's right. the first thing. <laughs> so just first first and foremost, just if we take a practical approach, it's extremely unsanitary. And just because pleasure is found in the thing does not mean that it's a pleasure that you should desire. That's why we seek the greater pleasures, which are of his kingdom and of his light. So pleasure is never just the end all to whether something is acceptable amen. Amen. amen and that falls under the umbrella of and the likes remember i said sexual immorality is a house and everything's housed inside of it that's in that house of sexual immorality it's obsession over behind behind animal like no you could just like now let me change that if you're obsessed over your wife's behind that's one thing but if you're just obsessed over women's behinds you're influenced by a fallen spirit that's called the male and female form you think you're obsessed over their behinds no you're obsessed over the form you're obsessed over the form and the spirit that drives that is fallen spirits if you're married and you're obsessed over your wife's beauty if you're beholden to her shape and her form that's one thing but if you're enamored by that shape and that form just as a whole you're under the influence of a spirit and you need to stick around to the end i believe that you said the ask does go ahead over there and say it in the microphone felicia Pastor, that's what she can say, because I, I want to make sure everybody can hear what she's saying, okay? You play your life. <laughs> you can't, you probably got to stay in there. That's about far as you can go right there. Okay, I'm good right here. All right, I, the she question is, want to hear. using vibration mm -hmm. tools in the marriage bed, is it sexually immoral as well? that would be considered something extra as well is that the whole question yeah okay when it, the question was using vibration tools within the marriage if you're dealing with things that involve penetration you should stay away 
However, there are other accessories and things that you can use that enhance pleasure, and I don't see anything wrong with that. This is me speaking. This is not God speaking. Amen. So you should err on the side of allow God to lead you, okay? Ask God to help you. Also to clarify, yes, making sure that it's even those tools are with your spouse, not for the uh, self-pleasure. Not for self-pleasure. Because yes. the body belongs to each other's. What does he say? He says that, do you not know that your body is not your own, but you are to give due benevolence to your spouse, and your spouse does not belong to them, but you are to allow God to give benevolence. You are allow yourself to give benevolence to your spouse. Yes. The bodies are an exchange for one another. Amen. Excellent. So that was fun. Now, when we go to, we were talking about fornication, idolaters, homosexuals, effeminate, all of these things, right? I'm with Sean. I don't want none of that stuff. I want my love and that's it. But that's just me. I want my love and that's it. You are more than enough for me. More than enough for me. So, but that's also, I'm going to teach about this at another time, but we like to take things like godliness with contentment is great gain, yet we don't want to apply it into our bedroom. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We like to make that about money and resources. We should apply that into everything. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I really appreciate the courage, freedom, wisdom, insight, clarity, and boldness with you are addressing these things. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. Oh, this is Felicia. She mentioned something about bestiality. Stay far away. Bestiality came from the fallen spirits. The first example we have of bestiality is through the fallen spirits. They didn't only just take women, they took animals also. And if everyone, you need to go back and listen to my first teaching on the days of Noah, part one, we addressed that. So go back to the days of Noah, part one, and then we'll talk about that. Brianna, I'm going to come to that actually in a second. Now, we deal with that fornicators, adulterers, sodomizers, homosexuals, effeminate. So this shows us right here that there are certain things that can be brought into the bedroom that are not supposed to exist at all inside of the kingdom. So if something's not supposed to be exist inside of the kingdom, what makes you think it can exist inside of the bedroom? That's how the marriage bed can be defiled. If something will hinder you from entering the kingdom or inheriting the kingdom, how do you think that you could take the thing that's going to prohibit a person from inheriting the kingdom and then take it to the marriage bed and say, marriage bed and say oh, this has been made pure? You understand? The thing that will keep a person from entering or inheriting the kingdom of God, all of those things, you then want to take that and bring this out of the bedroom and think that you can still inherit the kingdom. That's not the way it works. Amen? Remember, it's not about your pleasure. This is about purity. Yeah. Purity. And if you're listening under sound of my voice, you should long and desire to always be in right standing with Jesus because he and the Father can come and be with you. They can make fellowship with you. They can have oneness with you. The trap of sexual sin isn't just about all these wonderful taboo sexual topics. It's about the Father coming to knock at your door and him and his son coming in to sit down and sup with you. Him and his son coming to sit down and stuff with you. Holy Spirit making fellowship with you. Bringing the light of the son into your heart. The lust of the spirit drawing you away into the things of God. That's what the trap of sexual sin is about. Now, of course, it's kind of catchphrase. Like, got you. Got you behind on the hook now. Come on, let's talk. But this whole thing is about the wonderful Lord Jesus. The beautiful Lord Jesus. So if you're going to talk about the Song of Songs, you need to talk about how he's like a doe on the mountains of Bether. He's the one that takes away the distance and the separation between us. He's the one that overcomes everything that we can overcome so we can have fellowship with him. He's the one that says, let us go into the fields. Let us go into the vineyards. Let us check to see if the tender pomegranates have bloomed, if the grapes have been given the blossoms. And there I will give you my love. 
It's an appointed place for love. That means that there's a destination that he brings us to. And at that place, he gives us affection. At that place, he gives himself to us in a way that we haven't experienced in other places. But you have to first know, how do I interact with him before you can even be drawn away to that place? You understand? Most people don't know what it's like to be drawn into the villages, into the vineyards, into the fields. They don't know what it's like to check the tender grapes and the pomegranates. Why? They don't even know how to interact with them first because they get stuck on the trap of sexual sin. You're still dealing here and God wants you in purity so he can draw you away. You understand? Why are people saying Jesus is not his divine name? That has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about right now, Brother Ivan. Okay. Whether his name was Jesus, Jesus, Yahweh, it's not about his name. It's the fullness of his nature, which is in his name. He says what? When you baptize in the name, not according to his name. Why? In his name is the fullness of the Godhead. So whether I baptize in the name of Jesus or the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, why? In his name, the gnome of the fullness, the character. And that is what his name is about. Okay? Don't misunderstand what we're talking about right now. That has absolutely nothing to do with this moment. Okay? Because they said what? He shall be called Emmanuel, for God is with us. Yet he's also wonderful. Yet he's also counselor. He's also the prince of, like, don't make semantics out of things. Focus on loving him, serving him, so you too can understand what I'm talking about to be drawn away by him. And if you want to know that question, I'm more than willing to help you privately if you hit me on the DMs on Instagram. I'm more than willing to help. Anybody who knows, if you, were, if you send me a message, I may not get to it right away, but if you continue to send it to me, I will always, always reply. Always, unless you send something really dumb. Okay? Never <laughs> Lessons on God, God resistance. Excellent. So let, let's get. Go. I'm sorry. Go with you. <laughs> so we got that homosexuals, fornicators, adulterers, effeminate, all those things. I was going somewhere and it pulled me off track. I was I was getting ready to teach about the song of songs, and I was going to teach about the trap door of the spirit. That's why it's important. That's why it's important to, to stay in the vein. Okay. That's why it's important. I was just getting ready to teach you something, but now that we back. We're not going to talk about the trap door of the spirit. We're going to go back to. So everybody go ahead and thank Brother Ivan. Everybody put it in the chat. Say thank you, Ivan. I want to see I want to see 15 thank you, Ivans, before we continue. Everybody. <laughs> Ivan, I'm, Ivan, I'm just giving you a hard time. I love you. I bless you. I want you to send me the DM so I can help you. I have no problem answering that question. Just not right now. <laughs> Come on, let's light him, light him up. Light him up. Tell him, thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Ivan. See, Ivan, you're accepted in the family of God. Look at that. What you think is mockery is people showing you accepted. You're forgiven and you're accepted in the beloved and you're accepted in our family. It's all good. <laughs> Excellent. So now when we're talking about the homosexual, the offended, all that kind of stuff, right? One of the things that you even have to understand with the homosexuals was Hampson to North Sexual. Risen official, I want you to go back and listen to the days of Noah. Part one and part two. I addressed Ham and what happened with him and Noah. When he uncovered Ham, I addressed the whole thing. But if you read it, it says that Noah knew what was done to him. Just take that and put it where you want to put it. But that's not what we're talking about right now. Okay. But we talk about the effeminate and the homosexual. I was telling my wife, and I told you this, it's something that God has put in my heart because God wants to win that group. But we have to understand how to interact, right? We have to understand how to interact. And sexual sin is one of the few, like there's a lot of things that kind of fall under the categories where God will deal with the man. However, this specific thing is specifically not only sin against God, but against your own body. He classified it that you're sinning against yourself. 
You understand? He classified it that you're sinning against yourself. Now, I'm going to explain something to you that's not expressly written. But whenever you see the spirit that works through the alphabet community or the spirit that works through the effeminate, right? Because the effeminate doesn't, he, he labeled them totally different, right? He said the homosexual and the effeminate and the sodomizer, right? So he, he separated all of those things. So you have people who think they're, part, they're not a part of that community and they are. You have people who think they are a part of that community and they're not. But they're all under that umbrella of sexual immorality. Now, when you deal with that right there in regards to that spirit of that alphabet community, what is the driving force behind it? One of the driving forces that behind it is an antichrist spirit. Literally. It's an antichrist spirit that is behind that. Why? One of the things, and I said this on Instagram Live, one of the things that happens is this right here, when we start dealing with that, that, um, that, right, that community right there, that is the modern-day eugenics. It is the modern-day birth control. Excuse me, not birth control, population control. It is the modern-day suppression of a group and class of people. It is. It's an antichrist spirit. Now, I'm going to show you. I want you to go to Daniel chapter 11. Now, let's hope I got the scripture right because I pointed confidently. <laughs> <laughs> you like the way I d <laughs> Act like I got it right if I was wrong, okay? Amen. Amen. wrap this up I want I want to get this okay. and let's go to uh what's it say uh let's see, uh, go to verse like in the 30s somewhere I'm looking for when they talk about the antichrist mm -hmm. let me go there I'm gonna go there with you we're talking about uh, Cyprus hold on let me see. hold on Okay, I got. It. I'm gonna. Re I'm gonna read this one because the amplifier gonna jack it up. They gonna this one case where they gonna mess it up. Everyone, this is Daniel chapter eleven, verse thirty four. We're gonna go through thirty four to thirty seven. However, thirty seven is what we're looking for. Remember, I said one of the things behind it is an antichrist spirit, not the antichrist, a antichrist spirit. I will teach about that one day. The Antichrist versus the Antichrist spirit. Daniel chapter eleven thirty four. Now, when they fall, they shall be aided. I'm sorry, uh, my Bible app got messed up. Now, when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help. But many shall join with them by intrigue, as some of those understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the end of time, because it is still for the appointed time. Then the king shall do accordingly to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every God. This is thinking about the Antichrist spirit. This is what I'm talking about when I said this is one of the things behind that community. They don't know it. It's the Antichrist spirit behind it. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every God, shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. This says right here, he won't regard the God of his father nor will he have any desire of a woman. One of the fastest behind that is the Antichrist spirit. He tells us right here, you'll know it's the Antichrist, why? He won't have any desire of a woman. He won't have any desire of a woman. Now read it in your verse, but just read 37. Thank you, God. He will have no regard for... He will have no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he have regard for any other god 
for he shall magnify himself above them all. Let me tell you right there. He will have no regard for his father because no, he have any desire of the likeness of a woman. One of the facets behind the Antichrist spirit is to always oppose God's ways. That's what the alphabet community doesn't realize. It's a blatant offense against what God established. God saw that it was not good for man to be alone, so he made him a helpmate. And then they say, it's not good for man to be alone, but we're going to dwell together. It's a direct front against God's ways. Antichrist spirit. Antichrist spirit. A direct confrontation against what God established. What did he say? He will have no regard of the God of gods. Who's the God of gods? Our father in heaven. Our father in heaven. That's the God of gods. And he has no regard of his ways. Amen. Excellent. Even try to pervert the rainbow. Yes. They will take everything that it belongs to God to defile it. Everything that belongs to God to defile it. So this is part of that dynamic with that community. Even with the transgenderism. So someone was asking me this question. Like, well, what happens like if someone is tra- they 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 go forth with they go they go forth with the transformation for lack of better words, right? They go forth with the transformation and then they come to the reckoning and they want to turn back, but they can't. I said, well, they just can't turn back. But God can still save them. So you will have men in the earth in the days to come who change themselves to women who can't change themselves back, but yet they're still men who God will accept. They have to pay for the deed that they've done in the flesh. But God came to save the soul, not the body. Unto the salvation of your what? Souls. What did he say? Fear the one who can destroy the body and then cast the soul into hell. But then he says what? On that great day, we shall hear, then the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we too shall be caught up with him. And that caught up, everybody gets reset. Bop, they will go right back to what they were supposed to be. Perfect. Literally. You're going to see the richness of God's mercies in ways you don't understand in a life to come. Literally, you're going to see the vastness of his great well of love in ways you can't even understand. So then that's what people ask. Well what, well, what happens? Well, how about you don't even know anything spiritual because everyone's going to get a reset. Bop. Remember, I told you that this flesh is spiritual. It's going to take on a form that you didn't even know was possible in the day when we get risen up. It's natural, but it's spiritual. It's natural, but it's spiritual. I need him to pour his spirit out on me. Lift your hands and say, Father, please pour your spirit on me. It's that simple. It's that simple. Lift your hands and say, Father, please baptize me in your Holy Spirit. I never want to offend your ways and I want to live for you and serve you. God won't withhold it from you. It's that simple. So I was saying that to say the spirit behind that is Antichrist. Why? Because it's a direct front against God's ways. It's a direct opposal like Daniel eleven thirty seven says that they will have no regard for the God of God's. Neither will they have the desire of, neither will he have the desire of women. Why? He's a direct front against what God has established. Everything that God has established, he will oppose, including the sanctity of marriage, including the creation of male and female and what the uses were for. So even Paul went on to say that he said that, hey, they went on to leave the natural use of the body. You know that? And if you don't know that scripture, I believe that's in Romans, but it talks about how they went on to, and Sean, you can put it in the chat for me, Sean. They went on to leave the natural use of the body. Now, what most people don't know is that women were the first ones to leave the natural use of the body. Most people think it was men because of the sodomites. Women were the first ones that left the natural use of the body. That's why there's more women plagued by that spirit than there are men. They were the first partakers in that influence of that spirit. Let me see. Let me find out just so I can show you. That's Romans one and 26. Therefore, God, oh, excuse me, let's go to. Uh, 
Let's get back. We'll go to verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. What did I say? The Antichrist will always come against God's ways. God's truth he comes against. Let me find I'll skip that's all in one second. Truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the create the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in the lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not retain, like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgivable, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgments of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only to do the same, but those who also approve of those who practice them. So he tells us here what they're deserving of. But if you stamp it and approve it, you too are worthy of their same consequence. He tells you right there, if you put a stamp and approval on what they do, you also are worthy of death. You have to be able to stand in the evil day. You have to be able to stand in the evil day. Amen. So he shows us right there what? Men left the natural use, but women first left the natural use, and then likewise men. This is why you see that spirit affect women as the leading of that, and then men. That's why you see women at the forefront of the movement, not men. Women are at the forefront of that movement. Am I right or am I wrong? Because I don't keep up with it. I'm just saying what I know, but I imagine if I were to just kind of peruse some different articles and newsletters and things like that we would see that women at the forefront of things right mm -hmm. okay now we dealt with the trap of sexual sin the fallen spirits are the ones who influence this right then even with the hall dressing the fallen spirits are the ones who influence that so much so that we talked about the lust of the flesh the lust of the spirit the natural use of the body fornicators all that stuff the next thing we want to talk about is that jezebel which is also a celestial power is one of the ones who people come under when they give themselves over to these things so most people they they want to they want to bond jezebel but they don't know if they give themselves over to whoredoms they have become a disciple of jezebel every person who has given and partaken in whoredoms has once been under the tutelage of jezebel every person every person i'm going to come to dreams i got you we're gonna, I'm going to deal with dreams at the end because that's when we're going to start casting our devils. Every person who has dealt with delving in the world of whoredoms, meaning sex outside of marriage, sex outside of the context of marriage, however you want to back pocket package that thing up. Remember I said sexual morality at the house? If you've been up under that house, guess who owns it? Jezebel. Actually, it's kind of like Jezebel manages the house. Baal owns it. That's probably a better way to put that. Jezebel manages the house. Baal owns the house. So anytime you brought yourself under the umbrella of sexual immorality, literally you brought yourself under the sway of Jezebel, and you've also brought yourself to the altar of Baal. Mm -hmm. I told you, this thing is not just, you think it's just this, and it's not. It's more to it than meets the eye. Let me find, I want to find that in Revelations. I'm going to just type Jezebel, and I know she'll come right up. That'll come right up, right? <laughs> this is Revelations 2. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, 
the last and more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. It tells us right here that Jezebel teaches us how to commit sexual immorality and eat things that are sacrificed to idols. The ones who partake in that have been under her tutelage because why? She teaches us how to do it. She teaches us how to do it. She teaches us how to do it. And then when you read Revelations later on, it continues to talk about it, it just doesn't address her. It talks about how she would be cast into a sickbed because she was given space to repent and she did not. Yet she dragged others down and brought them into her whoredoms also. Mm. Remember I told you, you think you're just giving over to something, not realizing these are spiritual powers that play that are drawing you away. You think that man is fine. You think it's just, oh man, I just... You don't realize there's a superpower at play putting you before an altar spiritually. You just don't know it. You're bonding yourself up spiritually and your flesh is also being made a disciple of Baal. You have to resist sexual immorality. Remember I told you with the men down in, down in, in the valley, right? Where Balaam, when Balaam put the stumbling block there. The reason sexual immorality is such a strong thing because even God knows you can't overcome it. Our father knew you can't overcome this. You can't win this battle. You can't. If you stand there long enough to fight, you will lose. That's why he said, run. When it says flee sexual immorality, he's telling you flee because he too knows you don't stand a chance. I have often heard that Jezebel can only affect women. Can you please elaborate how that spirit affects men at first? Well, the first thing is people who talk about Jezebel don't even know what Jezebel is. With the exception of my spiritual father and only a few other prophets I've ever heard people speak about, just literally, with the exception of my spiritual father and on this same hand, I can count literally three other prophets, including myself, that have spoke about Jezebel correctly. People don't know Jezebel is a celestial power. The, with the religious saints, oh, Jezebel just, yeah, oh, that's a Jezebel, but they don't know what they're talking about. They have no clue what they're talking about. Jezebel is a priest of Baal. What I tell you, you don't bind Jezebel, you run from Jezebel. Now, people want to give Elijah a bad rap because he ran. But Elijah ran because he knew what Jezebel could do. Elijah didn't run on his own happenstance. Elijah knew, I got to get out of Dodge. What did it say? Jezebel arose and she began to paint her face. Now, if you understand what it means that she painted her face, fallen spirits are the ones that taught us even the dynamics that we have with the makeup that women wear. I'm not saying you can't put some fun because Sean be in there beating faces. So I'm not talking about what Sean does, right? She be in there killing it. When I say beating faces, that's what my wife says. She, she be beating it. What did they say? Beat to the gods, right? So, <laughs> she, Sean be in there doing it. Doing it. But that's not the makeup that I'm talking about. Jezebel would paint her face and array herself in a way that the fallen spirits taught men. When she would paint herself and array herself in such a way, that's the calling of the spirits to come. Elijah knew, I better get out of Dodge. Even the spirit knew, hey man, let me give you some energy so you can run faster. <laughs> we need you to, oh come on, we need, we, need, we need to hurry him on up. Now, you have to realize when Elijah, man, I want to throw my phone. Well, please don't throw your phone because you won't be able to comment. Now, <laughs> When Elijah dealt with the prophets of Baal, you have to realize that was supernatural. So I tell people, what do I tell you? If you can't deal with the prophet, if you can't bind Baal, don't deal with Jezebel. If you don't have the pot now, you know, I'm a, a lot of friends in my camp. I just bind Jezebel. I just, you're not that guy, pal. <laughs> you're not. You don't, you've never even had an encounter with an angel. You don't even understand the spiritual ranks and realms. You should be quiet. Why? When Elijah dealt with Baal's prophets, what they don't realize is when he brought them to the altar to slay them, all of them couldn't run from him. All of them got bound by angels. That's why he was able to go through bop, 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 knocking them down, knocking them down. If you don't have angels that walk with you that can bind the prophets of Baal, you can't deal with Jezebel. And even then, Elijah knew 
when she put that makeup on, I need to get out of Dodge. Because they didn't kill Bell, they bound Bell. That's why fire couldn't come down. Elijah knew Bell had fully within his power the ability to call down fire from heaven. Elijah knew it. Hey, soak the sacrifice, call Bell, let him bring down fire from heaven. He knew they could do it, y'all. He knew it. But Elijah also had powers working with him that had already taken care of Baal. He knew Baal wasn't showing up to the showdown. But Baal broke loose. And when Jezebel put that pan on Elijah, said, I better get out of Dodge. <laughs> you understand? So you don't even have the first understanding of how to interact in the spiritual realm, but you bind in Jezebel. You better be quiet. What did he say to Job? Can you deal with Leviathan? Can you pierce him through with a hook? Can you draw him out with a bow? If you can't, you better stop talking about what you don't know. Now, God is faithful. He will back us. God will take our ignorant prayers and send the angel like, man, let me back this dummy. Come on. <laughs> God is faithful in that way. But I'm bringing us higher. Bob and weave and flee. Yes. Jezebel, you run from. They taught makeup, weaponry, and the child. Yes, you're exactly right. What most people don't realize is, I wasn't even going to talk about that, but people... You can have people who weren't harlots, who weren't whores, who kept themselves pretty pure, but they were into astrology, horoscopes. And then they kick it down the generation and their children give themselves over to sexual promiscuity. They don't realize when they gave themselves into that horoscope, they submitted to a fallen spirit. The host of the starry heavens and they love sexual immorality. They love it. It's a sacrifice unto them. They love sexual immorality. So then what happens? The one who delves in that, he visits the third, fourth generation. So it skips you, but then you look up four years from now, you're trying to figure out why your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren are all out here cutting up because you submitted to the starry host of heaven. Now, if Elijah ran, we need to settle down and get our feet moving. We better pick him up and put him down real quick. <laughs> hey, not no shout, okay? Pick him up and put him down. So Jezebel is a celestial power. However, she's a priest of Baal. Baal determines the worship. The priest gives the worship or the sacrifice unto God. The priest understands what their deity wants. Jezebel understands Baal wants blood. Baal wants sexual immorality. That's why Jezebel, what, taught them to eat food that sacrificed to idols? How did they sacrifice that? They had blood inside of it, all kind of other things, and commit sexual immorality. That's how. So when we talk about Jezebel, Jezebel has to, everything to do with causing people to stumble before Baal. That's why I said if people masturbate, they're at the altar of Baal. They don't know it. They're at the altar of Baal. Jezebel is a celestial power. She's not just something to be played with. Amen? No. Them all the way down in there. Jesus. That wasn't it. I'm sorry, y'all. So now, understanding Jezebel, understanding these powers, all of these things are entities at play to keep you from purity. And the moment they get you out of purity, you start giving yourselves up to all these vices. And we've seen it now, just in the chat alone, people going through things in their marriage bed. People are that right there, just that alone let alone the masturbation, right? Now, what you have to understand is that even when God created the body, God created sexual in nature. By the, in nature, how else would he get us to procreate? Procreation is a task, right? Everyone who's had a child can understand, or because you are a child, your parents will tell you procreation is a task. Mm -hmm. This is how he was able to get us to do it. He's like, I got to put a caveat in there for him to want to do this now, right? So by default, man has been created sexual in nature. However, it doesn't change the fact about one having to possess his members. You understand? So although you've been created sexual in nature, it doesn't change the fact that you have to possess your members. Now, in possessing your members, there's some things that you can't deal with spiritually, you have to deal with naturally. What do I mean? Our single women, our single men are keeping themselves. And with God grace, if you're not, if you're on the sound of my voice from this day forward, you're going to strive to keep yourself pure. 
You're going to strive. You're here because you want to keep yourself pure. You're not hanging out at 11.30 at night to not be pure. <laughs> right? You're here to be pure. But in that, that body has desires also. And sometimes the only thing that can fix it is a cold shower. I'm just giving like a practical example, right? Sometimes the only thing that can fix it is a run. Sometimes the only thing that can fix it is something practical. Why? Because this is still a body. This is still a body. This is still a body. There's even those, some of our brothers who get afflicted or they feel afflicted because, now I'm not talking about sexual dreams where you have orgasms that you release within your dreams, but I'm talking about they just have what they call a night emission or whatever they call it, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the body just responds in a certain way. I'm not talking about sexual dreams. That's not from God. However, there's sometimes where people just have a certain response in the body. That's because the flesh. You understand? That's because of the flesh. The purity to have the ability to look at a sister in Christ's heart rather than out or without a man is a level I pray to achieve in him. What you say, sweetie? Which part? Go, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, amen. You still got the mic over there? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, so... I was saying that even within that with our single sisters learning how to possess yourself but even within our married people learning how to possess yourself because now some of you have done certain things that you have certain desires in, our, in your marriage bed that you've now found out that are unclean you now too have to possess your member and yield its desires unto righteousness because you've done things that now you're finding out isn't acceptable inside of the confines of marriage and that you should no longer do what do you have to do Possess your members and keep yourself pure. He who is of God keeps himself pure and the wicked one does not touch him. He who is of God keeps himself. He who is of God purifies himself. Go ahead, what you going to say, sweetheart? You were going to touch on what you said earlier, when a uh, man or woman is having sexual relations with their spouse. I was coming to that. Okay. I, okay. Remind me in like five minutes. Okay. Because we're going to, dreams and pornography is the last thing we're going to deal with before I pray for people. So I don't want to jump there without dealing with uh, masturbation first. Okay. So let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 5, John. Thank you, Lord. YouTube, y'all good? We're wrapping up. We're coming on the home stretch of this. What you say, sweetie? Hang in, Hang in there. We're coming on the home stretch of this. Read 20. Do uh, 20. You got Amplify, right? Yeah. Well, Let's do 27 through 28. Next slide. You want to make sure you're good. We wrap. We on the home stretch of this, okay? You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who so much as look at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Thank you. That's all I wanted right there. So here it says, you have heard that those are old don't commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, when we understand the spiritual functions i've taught this so you would have to go back and listen to a lot of teachings but i taught you even a spiritual body that man exists in three realms at the same time you're dealing with me i'm tapping that hand so you can hear it in the flesh yet there's a soul that exists also and yet there's also a spirit that exists also mm -hmm. right but it's in three different realms so most people don't comprehend it but he says that you are seated with him in heavenly places mm -hmm. in christ jesus that means that you is existing in another realm that has a seat with him in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes, it's not possible to sit with him in heavenly places if you're only dwelling in this realm. Mm -hmm. So if you sit with him in heavenly places, if all you do is dwell in this realm, you would have to go to that realm to have a seat with him in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. yes, so men exist in more realms than one. Yes. What happens is most men don't understand spiritual dynamics. Mm -hmm. They don't understand world of spirits. They don't understand any of the facets. That's how Elijah was on Mount Zion, yet he was also in the valley at the same time. Mm -hmm. Why? 
he was existing in different realms. And Jesus said that, how can it, how can a man enter the womb a second time? That's what he said to Nicodemus, seeing as though he's already been born. He said, man must be born of water and the spirit. Then he says that he who was born from what? Above. But if you're born from above, you were born here in the earth. So how can you be born from above? Yes. You didn't die and go to the earth. You went into the grave, but something, a transaction happened that you have no clue of because you came from a different realm to exist here. Yes. You understand? The heavenly nature replaced the old nature. Yes. That's a spiritual transaction. You came from another realm. Bop, here you go. You understand? So man exists beyond the realm that we understand, which is the realm of the flesh or what I refer to as the world of men. Yeah. The world of men is our carnal realm, although that carnal realm is spiritual because everything is spiritual because God is spirit. Mm -hmm. It's the carnal realm, the world of men. Uh -huh. Yet you also have spiritual realm. You exist there also. You're just clueless about it. You have no clue about it. You have no comprehension that you have a celestial body that exists in a different realm. But you should better have understanding because you're seated with him in heavenly places, but I'm looking at you seated in that chair right there. You understand? But are you seated with him in heavenly places? Yes. Okay, so that means that you're seated with him somewhere else, not here. You're seated here in the world of men, but there's a you that exists in a different realm. You understand? Now, I'm not, we're not going to go into all that. Today. I'm just trying to show the concept that you exist in different realms. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you go back to the teachings I've taught about it, it's woven all throughout it, you'll find it. Now, knowing that men exist beyond different realms, when he says that if you look at a woman to lust, you've already done it in your heart. Why? Because the soul doesn't differentiate the difference between what's happening and what's, tr what's true and what's not true. Mm -hmm. The soul can't tell the difference. The soul can't tell the difference. So now when we talk about masturbation, when a person masturbates, the soul doesn't know the difference whether there's somebody there or whether there's somebody not there. Mm -hmm. All the soul knows is what is taking place inside of its gratification. Mm -hmm. So what does Jesus say? If you look after a woman to lust, you've already done it in your heart. Why? Because in the side of the soul, it doesn't know if it's you or if it's that person. Mm -hmm. It doesn't know if it's you or if it's that person. That's why I've always said specifically for women, but men too, but I'm talking about to my single sisters, women who deal with the oppression, and I'm using the word oppression for a reason, women who deal inside of the oppression of masturbation, once they get broken free, they will be some of the deepest meditators that are there. Wow. Because it takes deep levels of meditation to masturbate. You think it doesn't because you just bop, 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 bop. You, you think that, but you don't understand the fastest that exists within the spiritual world. Inside of the soul, the soul has no clue what's happening. The soul knows the feeling of gratification. As far as the soul is concerned, it thought that you did it. That's why Jesus said, hey, if you look at her to do this, you've already done it. Now, the flip side that you don't understand is that when you give yourself over to that dynamic of masturbation, you literally minister at the altar of Baal. And there's a spirit on the other side that comes to meet you and receive your sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Literally. There's a spirit that comes to meet you on the other side, but you exist somewhere else. So you're in the flesh, not knowing what you're doing in the spirit is costing you big time. Mm -hmm. You're doing that, but you're not seated in the heavenly places. You're seated at the altar of Baal. You understand? Mm -hmm. You're at the altar of Baal. You're not in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when Jesus said that if you look after a woman with lust to do this in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. Why? You've already defiled her. You've already defiled her. You understand what I'm saying? You've already done it. Why? Because the spirit, excuse me, the soul does not know the difference. The soul cannot determine the difference. To the soul, the sentiment is the same. To the soul, the sentiment is the same. That's why the soul looks for satisfaction through different avenues, but the soul doesn't know, right? So if you're looking for a certain, let's say, you're like, man, I just wanted some, I, you were down, right? I'm just making up something. You're down and you just like, uh, Carl, I got you. I saw your question. I'm going to come to that. 
And if I don't, just I'll, I'll get. I got you. I got you covered. The soul is looking for satisfaction, but inside of the soul, the soul doesn't know the difference between what you're doing. So if you are down, right, and you're down, you may say, "Man, let's go get some pizza," but you may say, "Man, I want to go eat a whole tub of ice cream." The soul doesn't know the difference between what you put in your mouth. Is looking for a feeling. Is looking for a certain quenching. Mm -hmm. And that quenching now manifests itself inside of the flesh. The flesh has become a disciple of the soul. Mm -hmm. But the soul has been discipled by Baal. This is why you have to keep yourself pure. Mm -hmm. So now you think it's just your soul desiring something. You don't know you did a spiritual transaction. And now that altar is calling you back saying, hey, Janique, it's time for your next sacrifice. Come meet us. So now you get an itch in your body. You can't figure out why I have to quench this. Why do I have to? Why is, and you're a pure woman of God, holy woman of God, righteous woman of God, upright woman of God. But all of a sudden you get this. I can't shake this. Why? The priest are calling you back saying, hey, it's time to minister. You're being drawn away by the lust of the what? Flesh. But remember I said the lust of the spirit is trying to draw you away to the things of the spirit. So when Jesus said, hey, do not look after the woman because you've already committed your heart. We don't realize the spiritual dynamics that take place spiritually. We just think there's a, a transaction here. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Which is true. You repent. But it doesn't change the fact that there's a spiritual circumstance that now has to be dealt with. You repent. You're a first class citizen in God's kingdom. Literally. You turn. You turn, you're a first-class citizen in God's kingdom. God restores you. But spiritually, it doesn't matter that someone is calling and saying, it's time for you to minister again. Meet me at the altar. You understand? This is a trap. When I said the trap of sexual sin, I meant it. The problem is if you could see with what I could see and if you could know what I'd know, you would run far away from this stuff. It is a snare that men typically don't recover from that's why you find yourself you're like hey man i'm doing good i'm doing good i'm doing good i'm doing good bomb i fall it wasn't that you just fell it wasn't that you just fell that beckoning you couldn't overcome that beckoning you couldn't overcome you ever uh, seen it where uh like the old movies where they just kind of play around somebody sleep and then they tickle the feather on them and then make the person they have like shaving cream and then they go smack themselves You've been tickled in the spirit. You just can't figure it out. Before long, you're going to smack yourself. That's masturbation. Spiritually, tickle, 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 tickle. So you can no longer, you give. So you dealt with it before God. I repent of this. But spiritually, it has to be dealt with also. You understand? We have to disassociate you and break you from that altar bell. We literally, what did Josiah do? We have to defile the shrines that you have been ministering at. You understand? Literally. Would you say self-gratification equals the spirit of pride? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Now, when we dealing with my, um, my singles and marrieds, but singles specifically, this is how people gain spirit spouses. And this is how marriages fail. You've been ministering at an altar. Now a spirit finds you attractive. He comes and joins himself to you, but you don't know he's this because you don't have eyes to see in the spirit. Mm. So then you get married and that spirit is jealous of you. So what does it do? It orchestrates everything about in a way to bring calamity to your marriage. Why? Because he's jealous over you. It is jealous over you. Spirit spouses are deeper than what we understand. <laughs> see, Siri starting Jason McCall. A woman in show has a ritual. No, I haven't seen that yet. But this is literally how you invite spirits into your life. And then they join themselves to you. And then what? They like your likeness. Mm. They get attached to you. They actually like you. Mm. They, actually, they actually like you. They're actually jealous of you. So then they're fine with you for, for a period. But then they say, you know what? I'm ready to have her back. And all of a sudden, you're trying to figure out, how did I cheat on my spouse? What drove me to that? You're drawn away by your own lust. Mm -hmm. 
but you don't know what was feeling that lust was beyond your physical eye. You understand? This is why what happens when you look at men and women, my wife and I were having this discussion, what do they say? Men aren't attached, but women are attached, right? Even in those things, why? Their spiritual dynamics moving that you can't see. You think you're attached to the person, no, you're attached to that spirit. And that spirit says, I need you to do this to bring my altar a sacrifice. You understand? This thing is deep. This thing is deep in what we understand. You think it's just something that you got to deal with in the flesh. No, you got to deal with it in the flesh. You got to deal with it in the soul. And you have to deal with it in the spirit. Literally, we deal with it in the spirit tonight. But you still have the soul that has to be renewed, that still has to be washed by the water of the word, and you still have the flesh that has to be now discipled by the spirit. You understand? Can someone have more than one spirit as possible? Absolutely. It seemed like all heck broke loose when I got married. What happened was all heck didn't break loose. They were jealous over you. And they orchestrated ways to bring about the chaos that you experienced. What if your spouse has a dream about you having sex with them? Your spouse can dream about you having sex with them because it is the vehicle and the likeness by which you will give yourself over to it spiritually. What do I mean? It is the likeness by which you are familiar with. Mm -hmm. So you see it, but you don't realize on the other side you think you're dreaming, but you got yourself wide open giving yourself over to this. Mm -hmm. If you understand spirits, they can shape shift to any likeness in any form. Any likeness and in, remember I said any likeness in any form. Yeah. Every last one of them has that ability. Every last one of them. Now remember, I told you demons, devils, evil spirits, all that stuff is different. But the ones that I'm talking about, they can shape shift into any form. Mm -hmm. I'll teach more about that September 22nd to 24th, Washington D.C. Glory and power. Make sure you're there, okay? All right. <laughs> But the point is that you keep yourself pure. Now, when we talk about these spiritual altars, you get brought to the altar sometimes that you didn't even ask to be brought there. You get dragged there. How do you get dragged there? Rape. How do you get dragged there? Violations. Molestation. How do you get dragged there? Somebody puts pornography in front of you. That was my experience. So I was in the sixth grade, and a young man named Stephen Rios, I had never knew anything about sex. Like, when I say didn't have a clue, now my siblings, everyone, I was, like, when I say I was the clueless one of the bunch, because if you know me, I was literally given over to nothing but nothing. Meaning I wasn't, in, I wasn't into this, I wasn't into that, I wasn't into this, I wasn't into that. The only thing that ever gauged my interest was selling dope to get, to get fly and get fresh. And even in that, my siblings brought me into that world. So meaning by default, I was a purist just by nature. I was quiet to myself and just this, but you know, they brought things to me. I was like, well, if this is gonna allow me to get this bread, this is what I'm gonna do. But even in that, I wasn't a promiscuous person. Even my wife would tell you, I wasn't just out there with people and I was just trying to figure out how, to get, how I'm gonna stay fresh. That's all I wanna do, right? Just stay fresh, that's all I'm trying to do. So I wasn't giving those to those things. But I, re I can go back to the moment, the wiring that happened when he pulled that magazine out in the classroom. Hey, let me show you guys something. Mm. What happened? It brought me alive before that altar. And it would be years and years and years of bondage mm. because I didn't have someone to teach me the things that I'm talking about right now. I didn't have someone, I didn't have people who understood I, you know, I actually didn't know what a devil was until I came to the Lord Jesus. I didn't know about psychics. I didn't know about... So when people call me a witch and all that, I'm like, that's good because I don't even know what witches do. <laughs> I was literally clueless to all of these things, just shielded away from a lot of stuff. But I understood the spiritual dynamics when Jesus taught me about the altars and how I had to not only break free in the flesh, but I had to break free in the soul and I had to break free in the spirit because I had an altar that had me tied to it and they would call me back to minister to it. So it was a trigger, bop. Keep myself, keep myself, keep myself, keep myself, keep myself, fall. Keep myself, keep myself, keep myself, keep myself, keep myself, keep myself, fall. 
keep myself keep fall. Why? That spirit had claim and access to me. Come back. It's time for us to be together again. So understand this moment of freedom tonight is important that you keep yourselves. Bro, I've been rebuking the spirit of perversion throughout my days. And ever since I've been getting attacked in my sleep to the point where I woke up here in a whisper. And I'm on. Don't worry. This will be done after tonight. Yes, I found out about pornography schools in middle school. Thought it was actually games. Yep, that's right. So altars get established, or excuse me, not altars get established, but we minister at altars based upon traumas, experiences, and all of the likes. And we didn't ask to be there. We didn't ask to be there. But the enemy doesn't care because the enemy doesn't play fair. He plays fair. Like, so you always heard me say that the enemy plays by the rules. But he also uses our ignorance to say, hey, Bam, got you. Because we're unaware. Can you speak on discipline God's word and stomach say hi and other sinner they should be appointed for? Not right now. I'll come to that in a second. I don't want that to take me out of the way. However, focus on keeping yourself pure and allowing God to keep you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but he delivers us out of them all. The reason being that that's important, but I don't want to take us out of the way and give the enemy a loophole for someone to say, oh, man, that caught me here. Let me, you get what I'm saying? No, the other person is not held for that. Account. The other person is not held accountable for that defilement unless they position themselves like that of a harlot. Mm. Then they will be held accountable for it. Mm. And remember, you can position yourself in the position of a harlot while being fully clothed. Because if you're a harlot in a heart, the scent will still come off and it will still draw men. Mm. Amen. Mm. Excellent. So we went through that earlier. The marriage bed is undefiled. Now, this is what Felicia was saying. The marriage bed is undefiled, but here's the problem. Pornography has destroyed the hearts of men and women, but more so men. Pornography, and we're starting to wrap this up. Pornography has destroyed the hearts of men. And the reason being, just like we spoke about in the beginning, all of those things that they looked upon, like the starry host of heaven, Kemoth, and all those different spirits that I named, all of those things, all of the different Phalluses, the images and the likeness of men and women that they put, they couldn't help but behold it and then fall. Pornography has done damage into the marriages and into the lives of the singles. Why? Because they've beheld something and now that right there has been brought into the bedroom. So when I say the marriage bed can be defiled, you learned this act from someone who's giving service to Baal. And then you said, I'm going to take that and bring it here. Ooh. Not that you say, hey, I want to explore. Let's, let us explore one another. Let's learn one another's body. How do you like this? What do you like? No. Behind the scenes, you saw this. But what you didn't realize, that person was doing a ritual and a act. And you took that ritual and brought it into your bedroom. Mm -hmm. So you don't light the candles and do a seance, but you practice Baal's worship and then try to make your wife do X, Y, and Z. Ooh. You see? And I think most people have been guilty of this, not intentionally. Yeah. It takes us talking about this in a very open and candid way so people can be free. Yeah. People can be free. Remember I said you can't control what you see, but you can't control what you look at. You can't control what you see, but you can't control what you look at. My men in the chat, I can guarantee you, and I know if you're willing to be humble, you can say it. How many of you have seen things based upon pornography, and then that right there programmed itself inside of your subconscious. And then you look for that fulfillment inside of your spouse or a previous partner. women too but I'm dealing with the men the reason I said men is because if you confess your faults before God God will free you tonight remember I said some of you are going to be free by what I declare not even before we get to the point of casting out devils by what we say 
Me, me, one. Yep. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I know. God wouldn't set me down this path to do this if it wasn't for freeing his people. So then on the flip side, the women who, if they haven't been exposed to pornography, they've been exposed to formal partners who also enlighten them of adulterous ways. And then they bring that to their spouse. But then your spouse can't live up to what you previously experienced, which was idolatry anyway. So now you want your husband to be an idolater because you're not content in the heart. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We don't like to bring that into the bedroom. Because the fact is, if we were to stay true to the nature, man and woman would have one experience and that would be sufficient for the heart. I feel the power of God already. I do. Listen, when I tell you God is with us, God is with us. If you can't see, ask God to help you see. We're not alone. We're not. Lovingly convicted, yes. Why? Because God loves us in a way that would draw us unto himself. We all tonight will experience the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And that purity will give us the ability to ascend into the spiritual plane. What does that mean? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. What did Jesus say? Hey, if you look at a woman, you've already done it where? In your heart. God is about bringing purity to the heart tonight. Why? So we can ascend into the spiritual place. He that has clean hands and a pure heart can lift up his soul into the spiritual place. Amen. This is why I don't feel fully connected to my husband. God's going to break that free from you tonight. God's going to break the trauma from out of your body. I say trauma because you could have been expanded to a point that you were never to be expanded to. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall what? See God. Yes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Him. My job is to deliver you unto Him. That's why we're talking about purity. So, when the pornography, what it does is. Amen. But with the pornography, what it does is it cripples the women and the men. So now women are, ex are experiencing extended periods of not being married. Why? Because their eyes are set towards a certain thing. They think because they're not looking at private parts, but they're looking at his height. They're looking at his build. All of a sudden, God thinks it's great that you be married with a man that's shorter than you, but you can never process it. Why? You've been given over to the factions of the world. So you can never process. Oh, that's not what God has me. Well, you don't know God. You don't know him. You don't know him. You know of him, but you don't know him. What he says, I write to you fathers. You, have, you who have known him who was from the beginning. Fathers know him. You don't know him. You're a little child. Your job is to keep yourself pure so you can grow to see him. The world has tainted us in ways that we can't even comprehend. God had a spouse for you, but he moved on to the next one because you couldn't see him because he was shorter than you. Mm. God had a spouse for you, but you couldn't process the idea that he had a little more pudge than a six pack. Mm. And God had a spouse for you, but you couldn't process the idea that she wasn't as full as the next woman that you saw on TV. Mm. But Jesus found great satisfaction when we look at the Song of Songs. When she starts off, she starts off as a woman who her breasts are like raisins. By the time we get to the end of the song, it says her breasts are like these big old clusters. But at every point, he found satisfaction in her. At every point, he found satisfaction in her. Every point, when her breasts were like raisins, he found deep satisfaction in her. 
when her breasts were beginning to grow and blossom, he found great satisfaction in her. At the end, when her breasts are like clusters, these things can't even hold up. He just found deep satisfaction in her. But we can't be satisfied because the world has tainted our palate. So many of us, even in our marriages, we don't speak about how unfulfilled we are because we've been tainted by the world. And when I express the world, it's truly what I'm talking about earlier. The expression of fallen spirits is what's happening. The fallen spirits have deceived you into thinking that, oh, this is what God wants for me. No, you don't know. You don't know. God shaped it. God shaped and crafted every person uniquely. Every last one of them. Perfectly. You understand? Every last one of them. Perfectly. And pornography is ruining that. Now, the problem is you think some of you, you think you hide under the guise because you don't go to Pornhub.com. But yet you look at the guys in the pool and you fashion in your imagination what they look like. You look at the movie stars and you imagine their likeness in their form, pornography. To set your gaze upon something. Remember, say you can't control what you see, but you can't control what you look at. And then you set your heart into it and then you've committed adultery also. You too have committed adultery. And Jesus is likened those who serve him unto adulterers if we do these things. Don't be an adulterer before God. We thank God he's married to the backslider. We thank God. However, I don't want to be a backslider. I want to be my beloved in my beloved minds. You understand? Deliverance is happening. Yeah, some of you are going to get it free already. Listen, what's going to happen is some of you are going to start crying. You're going to cry deep tears of repentance and sorrow that's your deliverance some of you are going to hear different things coming out of your ears some of you are going to breathe deep some of you are going to begin to yawn and it's not going to be the tired that you were an hour ago literally some of you are going to give you you don't realize that's the spirit breaking off of you okay we've been crying yeah people are getting free I just didn't say it I told you by the proclamation of the word I know the grace God has given me that I can preach and people are delivered. Pornography, ruining people. Even scientifically, they prove it. Hey, when a person does this, then it triggers the brain and this and it releases this dopamine and then that, they chase that high from there on out. But they're always chasing the next high. So then they chase the next high because they're no longer satisfied by the previous high. So then by the time they interact with their spouse, they can't even function men speaking what they can't even function with their members in their capacity because they've already yielded it over to other spirits i'm about to delete these faves amen reject the unclean thing quickly and aggressively allow your spirit to lead you your spirit will say hey we don't like that let me teach you something about your spirit your spirit's going to testify against you in the day of judgment if you don't stop doing what you're doing Your spirit inside of you will come from out of you and testify against you. I didn't want to do that, but they made me be a part of it. You understand? This is a spirit of whoredoms that enters in through pornography. You don't realize it, but the spirit of a whoredom then comes upon you. You're a whore on the inside. You don't even know it. God told me last year to come up from London, but I didn't clearly understand. Well, now you do. Now you do. Now you do. So even in that, this is where, and there's no other way around it. There's no other way around it. But um, how can we say this in a, because we want to keep it in a, a way. But uh, this is why, I feel it breaking in my belly. Amen. This is why people. Okay. Let me, this, this I can only say how I can say it. This is why people size compare and all these other things. That's a spirit of whoredoms that brings you to do that. Most people remember I was talking about it in the car, right? They don't realize it. That's the spirit of whoredoms. That's literally an altar that has trained you. Literally, a altar has trained you, and now you bring that into your marriage. A 
altar trained you and taught you its tutelage and its ways of the fallen spirits and you now take that and bring it into your marriage because you find no satisfaction because of what you've already experienced or you find no satisfaction based upon what the world says you, des you, you deserve you understand a lot of you are getting free right now talking about this I know this is rough I know this is rough I know this is rough. A lot of you are getting free right now talking about it. Some of your marriages are going to thrive when we're done with this conversation. Because you're going to have better respect for your husbands and you're going to have better respect for your wives. You understand? God's going to break you free from the spirit of a whore. And this will no longer go through the generations. You see this even with children out of wedlock. This affects them in ways. So most people don't know it. Children out of wedlock are already defaulted into a sexual perversion. The default, even if they get married after the fact, if they were conceived out of wedlock, they're a gift from God. Remember, I said children are a gift from God. They're arrows in your hands, but it does not change the fact that those children need work inside of the soul because spiritually... They already have somebody beckoning for them. Why? They were brought forth outside of covering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leviticus told us that. If there's one brought forth who's not brought forth in the measure in which they should be, let them not even be amongst the camp. Mm -hmm. That's what Leviticus said. Let them not be amongst the camp. Consider this. I wonder, uh, find me Gabriel when he comes and speaks to Joseph please or oh, Sean if you could Sean if you're in the chat still f put the scripture where Gabriel comes to speak to Joseph about Mary conceiving and it will be the miraculous birth put that put that in the chat for me that way I don't have to search for it is it so for us who were born out of wedlock it won't be because we're going to break that off for everyone who's born out of wedlock who's a part of this. Mm -hmm. Let me know if she gets it. I want to be free. You will be free. John, read me that Luke 1, 26 to uh, 38. Mm -hmm. Now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's preg pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee. You mean Amplified? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Called Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, a descendant of the house of David. And the virgin Shabbat name Shabbat was Mary. Shabbat. And coming to her, the angel said, Greetings, favorite one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly perplexed at what he said and kept carefully considering what kind of greeting this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Listen carefully. carefully. You will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus he will be great and intimate and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob Israel forever and of his kingdom there should be no end Mary said to the angel how would this be since I am a virgin and have no intimacy with, a, with any man then the angel replied to her the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you like a cloud. For that reason, the holy, pure, sinless child should be called the Son of God. And listen, even your um, relative, uh, your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren 
is now in her sixth month. For with God, nothing is or ever shall be impossible. Then Mary, then Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel left her. Okay, excellent. Now I'm going to read the other portion of that. Now the birth of Jesus, this is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. And when it says minded to put her away, he's talking about divorce her. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to which you marry your, excuse me, do not be afraid to take to you, marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. The angel of the Lord literally warns Joseph so Joseph doesn't divorce Mary. Because if he divorces Mary, Jesus will be brought forth illegitimately. Why? He would be one, although it's the virgin birth, although it's a miraculous birth, she would be without spouse. Her without spouse is without covering. One who is, bur one who is born and brought forth in that measure can't even be amongst the camp. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Joseph would have messed the whole thing up. The angel of the Lord was committed to ensure that he doesn't mess it up. See to it that you don't put her away. For this thing that she's carrying is a holy thing. She shall conceive. And then what? He took her to himself. He did not put her away. If he puts her away, we have no deal. If he puts her away, we have no deal. So when we talk about children born out of wedlock, this is a real thing. This is a real thing that rolls through the generations. Now what I was saying before that was that the spirit of whoredoms is what runs rampant through the marriage and which causes us to no longer be satisfied. Why? Because of everything else we've experienced. You understand? Now, this is where we're going to end because for time's sake, read me Ezekiel 23. This will be the last scripture. <laughs> Pornography used to play in my head without watching it randomly doing daily errands and I would cry because I didn't want it. I felt tormented even though it hasn't happened in a while. Well, I realize when pornography runs through your head, you're not seeing it with the physical eye. That's because it was attached to the spirit, but that's broken off of you in Jesus name. <laughs> we, uh, let's go Ezekiel 23, John. Um, let me see what verse I want you to go to. Start at verse, uh, verse one. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, there were two women, Israel and Judah, the daughters of one mother, the United Kingdom, and they prostituted themselves in Egypt. From their youth, they were grossly immoral. In that place, their breasts were embraced and their virgin bosom was grass. Their name were Olola, the elder, and Aloba, her mm -hmm. sister. And they became mine, and they gave birth to sons and daughters. And as for their identity of their names, Olola is Samaria, capital city of Israel, and Aloha is Jerusalem, 
capital city of Judah. Perfect. I'll take it from there. So, you're not alone, Olivia. Same thing here. Yes, amen. So, here, these two sisters are harlots, but he likens these two harlots to Samaria and Jerusalem. Remember I said that he likens harlotry when he talked about Israel, that they played the harlot, right? So, he's likening it to this, but these are two harlots. So verse three says they committed harlotry in Egypt. They committed harlotry in their youth. Their breasts were embraced. Their virgin bosoms were pressed. This means they were allowing themselves to be fondled. Immorality. Then it goes through their names. Ohala played the harlot even though she was mine, and she lusted for her lovers, the neighbor, the neighboring Assyrians. So she belonged to God, but she lusted after other lovers, the neighboring Assyrians who were clothed in purple, captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding on horses. Thus she committed her harlotry with them, all of the choice men of Assyria, and with all for whom she lusted, with all their idols she defiled herself. That's why sexual immorality and idolatry go hand to hand. She has never given up her harlotry brought from Egypt, for in her youth they had lain with her, pressed her virgin bosom and poured out their immortality, immorality upon her. Therefore, I have delivered her into the hand of her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians for whom she lusted. They uncovered her nakedness, took away her sons and daughters and slew her with the sword. Now we skip down to her sister, verse 11. Now, although her sister Ohalaba saw this, she became more corrupt in her lust than she and in her harlotry more corrupt than her sister's harlotry. She lusted for the neighboring Assyrians, captains and rulers, clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding on horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw that she was defiled. Both took the same way, but she increased her harlotry. She looked at men portrayed on the wall, images of child death pornography. Okay, we're talking about she's looking at men portrayed on the wall. Images of, child, images of the Chaldeans portrayed in vermilion, girded with belts about their waist, flowing turbans on head, all of them looking like captains in the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of the nativity. As soon as her eyes saw them, she lusted for them and sent messengers to them in Chaldea. Then the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love and they defiled her with their immorality. So she was defiled by them and alienated herself from them. She revealed her harlotry and uncovered her nakedness. Then I alienated myself from her as I alienated myself from her sister. Yet she continued to multiply her harlotry in calling to remember the days of her youth. When she played the harlot in the land of Egypt, for she lusted for her paramours, whose flesh is like the flesh of donkeys, whose issue is like the issues of horses. Thus you called to remember the lewdness of your youth, when the Egyptians pressed your bosom because of your youthful breasts. Now, of course, if you're going to read it, it says a lot, but I'm going to read this to you in a different version. I'm going to read this and let's see the NIV. Now I got to go find that verse. Now I got to go find it. This is Ezekiel 23 towards the end. This is the last one I'm just trying to find. We're talking about the donkeys. Here we go. So when she carried on her prostitution openly and exposed her naked body, I turned away from her in disgust, just as I had turned away from her sister. Yet she became more and more promiscuous as she recalled the days of her youth. And when she was a prostitute in Egypt, there she lusted after her lovers, whose genitals were like that of donkeys and whose emissions were like that of horses. So you longed for the lewdness of your youth when in Egypt your bosom was caressed and your breasts were fondled. This right here, when I told you this, the spirit of a harlot, she said that she longed for lovers who were like donkeys and who could permit semen like that of horses. That's the spirit behind that stuff. The spirit behind that stuff that brings about the comparison in the bedroom and all of that, that doesn't just come from the world. No, that comes from idolatry. That comes from the sacrifice to fallen spirits. He said it right here. 
that one, she lusted after other lovers who had genitals like that of donkeys. She lusted after other lovers who could admit themselves like horses. When you read further in there, when it says that they came into her or they came unto her and they loosed their immorality upon her, these were men that were putting their semen upon her. Where do you see that at? Pornography. You think this is just something that, oh man, I just saw this and I desired this. You don't realize you're bringing harlotry and idolatry, which is through the image of fallen spirits influence into your bedroom. You think, oh man, I just would like a little more. I would like a little later. You think that's what it is. No, sweetie. You're under the influence of a whore. You're under, you're under the influence of a whore on the inside. You think it's simple. There's nothing new under the sun, literally. Free me, Lord. I want to be pure. You will be. You will be. You will be pure. This is crazy. I agree. But God wants to free his people. God wants to bring redemption to the marriage bed that it may be undefiled. You understand? Now, of course, there's we could just continue to go. I could, we could go through scriptures all night long, but I want to, I mean, this thing, at this point, it's the fourth time, I want to honor people's time. And I want to pray for you. But YouTube, I want to know, are you guys, are you guys blessed? Did you receive? Let your hearts be pure. That you would not look upon other lovers, but you too would have godliness with contentment and it'd be great gain in your life and in your marriage. When I say look to Jesus and he will, real, he will reveal the Father to us, it's not just buzzwords and catchphrases. Do you understand? When I say that the fornicator, the idolater, the sodomizer, the effeminate, none of them will have their part within the kingdom. Every last one of us has been subject to that. When I say that you have an existence within the spirit, let that be pure. Who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Who can see God? He who is pure in heart. I could teach about a bunch of other things, but the fact is I already know the grace is here to get what we need to get done. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to prolong it. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a second so we can move this chair. I, my wife, we're going to put a screensaver up just for a second so we can move the camera and I'm going to pray for you guys. I'm going to give you instructions on how to pray also. I want to make sure that we're clear about this. While we're on this break, don't do anything unnecessary. Don't do unnecessary, unnecessary talking. Don't do un, any, un, any unnecessary, just aimless speaking, any of that kind of stuff. The enemy would love to get you off track right now. If you're spiritual, you can feel it. The enemy would love to get you off track right now. Stay focused. Okay. And I'm going to pray for you. And it won't be long drawn out. We'll just see how, how, how it goes. But we're going to pray. God's going to break the chains of wickedness. Literally, a lot of, a lot of you are already free. You've been yawning. You've been crying. You've been scratching. All of that. You're feeling liberation. God is freeing his people in ways that we don't even understand. Because purity is what he desires for his people. The marriage bed will be undefiled. Why? That way you may be pure even within your homes. Amen. So I'm going to use the restroom. If you're going to do anything, pray. And then we're going to get this thing done. I love you.